would you join us, Betsy? <laughs> <laughs> I have copies of the newest draft of things that we said. We're on 192? On that, for the record, Betsy Ann Rask, Legislative Council, you should all should have in front of you draft strike all 2.2 to be a strike all amendment to S192 regarding the professional regulation of law enforcement officers, specifically the transfer of the professional regulation from the Vermont Criminal Justice Training Council to the Office of Professional Regulation. What I have done in draft 2.2 is highlighted the changes from your previous draft 1.1. We reviewed draft 1.1 that I'm highlighting and show how it changed from the bill as introduced. These show all of the changes from draft 1.1. So everything here is that's highlighted would be new language to address some of the issues that have uh, been raised by draft 1.1. I will note that there was an agreement on everything, on how draft 1.1 should be changed. And my direction was to draft the strike all amendment showing the changes that this committee agreed to and that OPR agreed to um, in regard to the changes that were proposed. So all I'm going to do, Madam Chair, if it works for you, is to go to the places where there is highlighting because those are the only places that have new language for you to review. Everything else has been reviewed. So the first place where there's highlighting is at the bottom of page five of draft 2.2. This is in regard to what constitutes an effective internal affairs program that every law enforcement agency is supposed to have. And in regard to civilian review, there was uh, a change on page five, line 17, to say that a civilian review has to provide for officer discipline uh, review by civilians, which shall be a select board or other elected or appointed body or person. Draft 1.1 used may. And it was my understanding that you want to say who those civilians need to be. So they shall be a select board or other elected or appointed body or official. And then also you discussed um, during your review of this bill last week um, how to address who should be reviewing officer discipline imposed by the sheriff. So draft 1.1, you said that a sheriff can appoint, a sheriff may appoint a committee of uh, three to five civilians to review the discipline imposed by the sheriff. Uh, but you had discussed that you would like to say, actually that some other entity within the county has to appoint the civilians to review the discipline that's imposed by the sheriff. So this new language on the bottom of page five would say, the assistant judges of a county shall appoint a committee of at least five, and up at least three and up to five civilians selected from among the elected officials who reside in the county to review the discipline imposed on officers uh, by the sheriff. Good there? Mm -hmm. All right, great. Then the next change that you'll find is on page 11 and 26 BSA 5323 regarding applications that people will use to apply for law enforcement officer licensure. Excuse me, okay. on, the, on the page right before you have the section. Oh, thank you, thank you, Senator Ayer. Thank you for flagging that for me. Um, so there was a change there. That's in regard to licensure renewal. The section I'm looking at is on page 10. Thank you, Senator Ayer. Didn't jump out at me because the change here in section 5322 licensure renewal was to remove draft 1.1's subsection B which was different than what you see on page 11, that subsection B was subdivision A2 under draft 1.1. Now A1 just becomes A, A2 becomes B. The language that was struck under draft 1.1 was uh, would have provided the uh, uh, director of OPR with the ability to adopt rules necessary for the protection of the public to assure the director that an applicant whose license was lapsed or who has not worked for more than three years as an officer is professionally qualified for renewal and that the conditions imposed under that subsection B would be in addition to requirements imposed under A. The agreement was to completely strike that subsection B altogether 
so you don't see it at all. But I just wanted to flag for you that that section was amended to get rid of that subsection B that came out. Does that, does that yeah. make sense or not? Right. It was agreed. Was that one of the things the committee did or the interested parties agreed on? Uh, it was proposed by one of the interested parties, and it's my understanding that OPR agreed to uh, removing that because I believe part right. of the conversation was it's um, partially at least addressed by the council. Right, right. Okay. Thank you. Uh, the next revision is to uh, 5323 there on page 11. This is about um, what applications contain and specifically um, the oath that an officer would need to take um, in completing an application. So the former draft 1.1 in the second sentence said, each application shall contain a statement under oath showing the applicant's education, experience, and other pertinent information. It has to be accompanied by the fee. There was conversation about What's other pertinent information? What are we really talking about? Education and experience. So the agreement was to substitute certification for education and experience, because that's how officers are getting their education and experience annually through their annual in-service training at the council. And it's other pertinent information required by law. So I think you heard part of the discussion last week that for all OPR licensees and other state licensees, whenever you apply or renew a license, you have to complete information about yourself showing, for example, that you are up to date in your taxes and, and child support. And there's also other questions I believe that OPR asks about the licensees <coughs> regarding felony convictions, for example, that I believe that they ask all uh, licensees. You can get more specific feedback from OPR on what all licensees are required by law to address in their application. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Okay. Then we move down to the next section on page 11 regarding licensure generally in 2653-24. And this addresses um, what was referred to in the de facto officer conversation. So the uh, discussion last week by this committee was to have language in this strike all to say that an officer's acts are valid as the third person's um, even after the license expires, but only 30 days after the license expires, right? Mm -hmm. right. After that, 31st day, officer makes an arrest. The discussion here was it may not be valid. Mm -hmm. it may not, that's right. It may not, and that, that puts some responsibility on the officer, but it also puts a responsibility on the executive officer, the agency. Mm -hmm. I thought we, um, where do we see the May? And I have to say, shall only I, apply. I have to say May because we talked about the de facto officer doctrine set forth in case law, and now that you're kind of fiddling around with the idea of what is a valid uh, action by an officer who's not really fully licensed in this case. Mm -hmm. I don't know how court's going to treat this language. The court might think, okay, after 30 days, all officer acts are completely invalid. Or maybe the court will say, well, the legislature really intend to make that shift in de facto officer doctrine. <coughs> I can't predict. You have the language here specifically in subsection B that would say the actions and legal authority of an officer employed by an agency or elected to an office, so we're talking about people who are actually working for an agency, and I use or elected to an office because to apply to sheriffs or constables, whose license has expired and who acts with apparent authority of a license though issued under this chapter shall be valid at law, notwithstanding the failure to renew it. Okay, so their license expired. The day after the expiration, they go out and make an arrest. This would say they're acting with apparent authority of a license, and they go out and make an arrest. That arrest shall be valid. However, as you discussed, there's a hard and fast 30-day window to allow them to do this. So subdivision B2 would say the provisions of this subsection B shall only apply during the 30-day reinstatement period described in sub C2, which we'll get to in a moment. 
with me so far? Yeah. All right. Mm -hmm. Let's turn to the top of page 12. I'm glad we're doing this at an earlier hour with more sunshine. I agree, Senator. All right, top of page 12 starts a new subsection C, requiring the director of OPR to provide written notice that an officer's license has expired, and notice has to be provided to the officer, the officer's executive officer, if any, because the officer might be the executive officer, and the council, criminal justice training council. And C2 is the operative language. It's referred to in subsection B to say, the effective date of a license that was, re that was renewed during the 30 days following license expiration relates back to the date the license expired and up to the date the license was reinstated and the license shall be deemed legally valid during that time frame. That's, um, uh, Ms. Namotny referred to the legal fiction that actually it was um, valid the whole time even though it was expired during that 30 day expiration. Um, I just want to make sure we're not creating a lot extra work for OPR. This, this written notice only goes out on the day one of the 30 days, right? So they, they, we've heard that they give six weeks advance notice and all that's going to be normal, but then we're only into the expired phase. Is that correct? Correct. Okay. So for 99% of the time, OPR won't have to do anything special. As long as officers timely renew, I hope. They're yeah. still going to give the six, six weeks, weeks before, all that. Yeah, four, yeah. two, no, blah, blah, blah. But then yes. on the day, if an officer allows his or her license to expire despite those um, warnings. Right. This provides uh, a duty on the director of OPR to provide notice. It, it's only yep. just one time that's required here. And can written be by email? I, yeah, I believe so. Written from, as, as long as it's in writing. As long it, as it's, yeah, okay. Great. It doesn't say what type of notice it no. has to be. It just can't be, hey, you. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Are we good so. on that part? <clears throat> okay. okay. On page 12, there would be a new 5326, and this was something that the uh, law enforcement officers asked for, um, and that uh, OPR was also willing to do, which was to keep an officer's personal information confidential. So this language would say that a law enforcement officer's home address and their personal phone number and email address produced or acquired under this chapter, because it could be in a license application, maybe it's through an investigation that this information OPR obtains, shall be kept confidential and are exempt from public inspection and copying under the Public Records Act. And I did talk with our public records attorney to discuss this language, and um, it's my understanding you do not need to amend the Public Records Act specifically to write this in as an exemption. As long as this language exists, it's explicit that this info would be kept confidential. So why should police officers be a law enforcement officer be any different from us? That's a policy decision. What do you mean different from us? I mean, why are we allowed to have our phone numbers and addresses made public mm -hmm. and they are? You don't have to have your, when you do your bio and when you put that on your on the website, you don't have to put your home address and your home phone number if you don't want to. Right, but there's nothing that says you have to. No, that's correct, but I don't know why, uh, uh, why should a police officer who's a member of a community not um, be publicly, you know, I mean, I don't know why they deserve, I mean, we're all exposed. Just the minute you step up into public service, you're exposed. As a, well, they're fairly exposed. <coughs> but no more than we are. Oh, yes. They're well, more the like people we talk to don't have guns. And the people we do, talk to aren't doing drug, drug deals on yeah. the back lot. The nature of the work is I, considerably different. Are, is this currently the case? Are they currently exempt? Well, I, I think that if, if, if police officer Mike Smith has his name in the telephone book and they're in Woodstock and everybody knows that Mike Smith is the police officer, it's there and people can look it up. What this says is that OPR is not going to right, divulge this. this information as a part right. of their record. Right, this is just limited to OPR. Correct. Just, I mean, if, yeah. And this isn't a new exclusion? Do we have to check with the public records people? Oh, should we check with <laughs> the public records people? Public records people, what do you think? Style them up. What do you think? Okay. Yeah. <laughs> no, I, I, I think this, is, this, this exists. Is All right. But this it is isn't a new ex 
is the currently exemptions, there is an exemption of kind of a broad exemption that deals with personal information of people. And I think this would be oh. caught under there. Okay. There is um, <coughs> for the uh, right. elections, for example, can't give out telephone numbers. And if you don't want your home address given out on the checklist, it isn't given out on the checklist. You can use a post office box instead. So um, there are exemptions for personal information. Do, do you, I'm curious, like nurses who are registered at o, OPR, do we exempt it similarly? I don't believe there's any specific information like this for other OPR licenses. Any specific exemption? Like this, so. There is an exemption in 1 BSA 317C, which is your list of exempted um, information, in subdivision 10 that says um, information, lists of names are, are kept confidential, but then it goes on to say, but lists of professional licensees are not exempt. So it kind of begs the question when it refers to that, is it just talking about a list of names? Or does it include names and other personally identifying info? Right. This is making it very specific to the request, which was that OPR keep officer personal info confidential. Well, I hope they put, put that I like gold better than silver. If they're going to put all that stuff, they can, people will know what to give me for my birthday. So we're all, it's all on there then? The rest of the stuff? Uh, I have a license. Sorry. Can people look up where I live? Currently no. in OPR. Madam Chair, for the record, Colin Benjamin, we have at OPR, uh, we give uh, professionals the choice as to what information to display publicly um, on our, so for APRNs, for nurse practitioners uh, who are concerned when they work in the reproductive health area, they want a public facing address that may just be their business address and not their home address. So. We give folks that uh, that choice right now. Thank you. So if you want to, I'll read to you the current um, 1 BSA 317C10, which is that <coughs> this is informa information that would be exempt. It says lists of names compiled or obtained by a public agency when disclosure would violate a person's right to right to privacy or produce public or private gain. Provide provided, however that this section does not apply to lists that are made by law available to the public or lists of professional or occupational licensees. So it just kind of begs the question, is it just their names now that are protected or, or excuse me, they're just their names are not protected, but the information about them are? It's well, it seems question. to me that if they're given the option here mm -hmm. and they say, I don't want my name, I don't want my address and my telephone number yeah. listed, they have the option. And in this case, we're just saying it's a, Mm -hmm. So you can have a list of the public. police officers that are certified and licensed, but you can't have their home address and their telephone number. And, That's right. and I do have to say that I think that the people we're dealing with are not people that we regularly deal with. Although after some of the emails I got this weekend, I'm not so sure. Oh, no, yeah, yeah, some, some bad ones. Public. I mean, they're pretty bad yeah, jobs in every area. They are routinely, for instance, Pivotal witnesses in court cases. Right. Who are? Police. Police. Uh, police. Oh, sure. So if I'm going to, you know, mm -hmm. come on, we'll play that out. We'll just go to their house and yeah. make sure they don't show up to court. I think there's a significant public safety. I think so too. And, and I, do. I just wanted to make sure that, that, yeah. we, that we didn't get caught hoist, right. hoisted on our own petard with it. And if somebody really, really, really wanted to it's know where to. Officer Mike O'Neill lived and his telephone number, they'd probably be able to find it someplace else. We're just so, telling They so just go door to door, door with me. Well, we're just saying OPR, it's not OPR's right. business to make that public. Right, no, I, and I, and I, I, I recognize that it's just OPR. Yes. Okay, let's move on. So then you get out of the council chapter, or excuse me, the OPR chapter, and you get into the council chapter, and so the next change you'll see starts at the bottom of page 20, but it's the same change you already reviewed earlier in the bill, the count because the council chapter also has a definition of what constitutes an effective internal affairs policy because council's going to have to come up with a model effective internal affairs policy for agencies to develop. And so the same change regarding um, 
civilian review on page 20, which that civilian review shall be by a select board or other elected or appointed body or person and the same language regarding what an effective internal um, affairs review would look like for sheriffs, which is that the assistant judges of a county shall appoint a committee of three to five civilians um, elected from among the elected officials in the county to review discipline imposed on officers by the sheriff. All righty. And then, so the last change, you'll see, um, We'll start off by looking at the bottom of page 25 in section 10 regarding transitional provisions. So this is uh, this discussing how to transition officers from currently being certified and regulated by the council to then being licensed and regulated by OPR. So this language now says um, on the effective date, a person certified by the council is deemed licensed by OPR so that they go, can go out and practice with their license like this bill requires them to do so. But the new language added at the top of page 26 is to say, upon payment of the initial license fee set forth in 26 VSA 5325 and set two of this act. To make clear that officers, when they uh, start this new regulatory structure, they will have to pay the initial $100 license fee to OPR to become licensed and the effective date of this requirement is January 1, 2019 under the effective date section. So $100 for each officer by January 1, 2019 in order to become licensed. This will have to go to finance, is that right? Yes, mm -hmm. it does. That's why we need to get it out of here. Mm -hmm. Is there? They're not. Yeah. Yes, there is a C in here. Hundred dollar mm -hmm. licensing fee. Oh, I didn't see the month, the amount. Yes, well, it's, it's a, in here somewhere. Because yes. it's a new process, it's a new fee. Yeah, the fee section is on page twelve. It's called fifty three twenty three five fees, and then it just refers to three VSA one twenty five B. Um, which is a section in general <coughs> PR law regarding license fees for advisor professions, which is $100. Yeah, yeah. $100 for initial license, $200 for renewal. Oh. So, if you approve this draft, I just noticed I need a period on page 27, line 13 at the end of that. I was gonna tell you about that. Oh, thank you. God. And I need to delete the highlighting, assuming there's no other changes. So I could do all of that, delete the highlighting, and add that period for draft 2.3. Or 2.2. I can do 2.2. Just it might be easier to track and people Whatever. won't be Whatever raising questions about that. Let's make it 2.2 as corrected. All Unless right. you want changes, two point two. Well, let's hear now. Rick. Fine. Colin. Fine. Mike. I am as well. Quinn. Anybody else? Wow. Do we have I wonder a, if we can call. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> Where's Beth? Where's Beth? Beth is in Honduras. Oh wow. Beth is in Honduras. Bueller. But I did tell Bueller. her that we were going to take make the changes to that um, de facto section, but nothing else. And so, Vince, and Vince left a message saying he got called away, but he is happy with the language that, oh, well, we always want to make Vince happy. Do, does anybody have a, a, men, a motion? I just wanted to mention okay. that I did get contacted today <laughs> from the Rutland City Police Department Union expressing concerns. I don't know why it, Right. Oh, yes. Yeah. What are their concerns? I think it talked to their house members. Uh, they don't want to pay $100. The cost, because OPR will have to add staff, the cost of which will be borne by the Vermont's law enforcement officers. And the, the, the investigations of unprofessional conduct will be split between an officer's employing agency, the council, and OPR. Well, so they're just, they're just making, and, and I think I actually got another one from another union member from a different community. So I'll, I'll just note it, that's all, for and, the record. And I might point out that the underlying, I believe at this point the number was H22, the underlying had already laid out all of the, the disciplinary actions. OPR was not involved at that point, but 
it, it did lay out the disciplinary action. So, but so noted. So. All right. Well, at least they weren't tough. Is anybody? At least they weren't tough, even if a little late. Well, okay. Does anybody want to move? I'll uh, move that we vote out uh, S192 draft 2.2. That's correct. Yeah. That's correct. <coughs> okay. Anybody? Good work, Betsy. Yes, thank nice you. Nice work. Nice threading that needle. <laughs> I have to say, I thought last week at 6 30, we were never going to get there. You ready, Chair? Yes. Clarkson? Yes. Pearson? Yes. Hair? Yes. Oh. Yes. White. Yes. Great. Motion carries five zero zero. Who would like to report this? I notice you've done a lot. You've got a lot. I I don't need to do, but I'd be willing to do. Oh, it. oh, because I have I have three of them on for tomorrow. I've noticed that. Yeah, yeah you must be uh, studying late tonight. Uh, yeah. Well, I've got two for egg. So. Would you like well, to if, do if this? you want, I I've got two. Tomorrow, I don't mind so. doing that. Good. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Pearson. Thank you, Betsy. Thank you. And thank you, everybody. That was Pearson, Pearson, Pearson Law and Order. Order. 81. This is the, um, Bryn did a, a draft um, this afternoon, or over the weekend, and then I gave her some notes, and she has uh, done some more as of, Today. Is this the 27th? Mm -hmm. oh, no, it is. Okay. PM. Yeah, one o'clock today. Yeah. What, this afternoon. She just finished. Do you have a copy? No. Do we have more copies? Um, is there? Is it posted? We could just post it. Um, I'm posting it right uh, now. Yeah. Do you have your iPad with you? I don't. Okay. I, can, can we get a couple yeah. more copies? Okay. Here. So, if we can, um, Bryn is tied up upstairs with the <coughs> House Judiciary. Um, so, if we, I guess we, if we can just kind of start walking through it and see what the, because there's no one to walk yeah, through it. So. Gail, I emailed something yesterday. Yeah, Is I put it in there. Thank you. So, this is, um, Let's just look at it and see. I, I kind of gave her this little, uh, kind of the, the outline. First we have the, um, the panel Sorry. set up. I have a copy. We were given it. We were, I don't have a copy. You should, oh, we, she just, I just handed it to you and you said, I, I have 281. Yeah, I didn't have it. I said, I don't have it. You said another copy is coming. I'm just going to, yeah. I, I sent her kind of what I thought was an overall outline, and let's see if, if I was right here. So first we would have, um, by September, we would have a panel appointed, but, and that was this panel made up of five people by the, those five appointing people. That panel immediately would begin to get the services and support of the agency of administration. Then that panel would work with the secretary of administration to de design an RFP that would go out for a consultant to work on um, looking at uh, systems issues that cause discriminatory actions in the system. 
by across the state. Huh? Yep. Across, across all states. Across all states. Across all states. Yes. Um, I'm not going to try and be too, too no. detailed here. I'm just going to. Okay, so that consultant would be on board. They would have that RFP done and, uh, and the RFP out by November. Then by, I believe we said, November, uh, January, they, that consultant should be on board. Is that right? Uh, I can't remember the exact timing. Yeah. It's in here. Oh, and there's Bryn. Oh. oh. Boy, did you save my butt. <laughs> Would you come and yeah, sit with us? <laughs> Are you feeling better? Yes, thank you. Good. <laughs> Does anybody have a copy that I can give to Senator Clarkson? And I'll repost it more. I'm happy to just. No, I, we're sharing. There's we're at the moment. We're okay, we're sharing. Okay. We're good. Oh. So you got, you I'm did stretch my things in here. I did, but I just wanted to point out that I got them um, not so long ago, and so I, right. I'm not sure I incorporated all of them yet. In okay. fact, I don't think I did. <laughs> well, we'll look through them in. And they, those were just my comments. They weren't from the committee, so okay. I don't know if anybody else even agreed with them. Okay. So, all right. Okay. So, let's. Do right. you want to walk us through it? Sure. All right. <clears throat> Good afternoon, committee. For the record, Bryn here from the Legislative Council, and I'm here to walk you through Draft 2.2 of S281. Um, I tried to highlight all of the language that's new from the last draft you looked at, uh, but I'll go ahead and point it out too. So section two is an entirely new section. Okay. This is the uh, provision in existing statute that sets out the powers and duties of government ca um, governor ca governor's cabinet members. And I don't think anybody ever saw draft 1.1, except for me and the okay. administration. And okay. People, but it, that was on Friday, right? Well, dra I think it was 2.1 because you saw 1.1. Yeah. 2.1, yeah. Okay. Okay, so this is highlighting all the changes yeah. from draft 1.1. Okay. okay. Right. So, section two, this is new section, powers and duties of the governor's cabinet. It adds a new subdivision there, subdivision B, which provides that the cabinet must work, work collaboratively with the chief and provide the chief with access to records. So this is um, intended to address the committee's concern that there was not um, direct language requiring the cabinet to work with the chief. <clears throat> section three, there are a bunch of new changes here. So this section 5001 provides that the position um, is within the executive branch, not within the agency of administration, um, for the purpose of identifying and working to eradicate systemic racism within state government. That just replaced some old language that nobody liked. Um, Subdivision B sets out that the uh, chief has the powers and duties enumerated within 2102, but she'll operate independently of the governor's cabinet. So here's where I'd like to point out to the committee that there, I think that um, it's a little confusing mm -hmm. because in section one, we, set, we say that the cabinet consists of the secretaries and the chief, and then we say here in subdivision B, that the chief is not part of the cabinet, the chief is independent of the cabinet. So I think we have to we do. decide. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I, so, think, I think some of the conversations we had is, should it be part of the cabinet? And we dealt kind of with that by saying the governor couldn't get rid of the person, mm -hmm. only the panel could, but I think that we need to have that discussion more. Okay. Just kind of flat that I, yeah. <clears throat> I've, I've thought of it as housed within the executive branch. In other words, you know, maybe physically or, or definitely physically sitting somewhere in the, I think we had a, the AOA and, you know, use their internet and their, some of, some of that stuff, <coughs> but not part of the cabinet. I don't, I think, you know, we've, we've talked about it being cabinet level in terms of a level yeah. of authority, but I don't think we should be in the position of forcing. I, mean, I, don't, I don't see how the legislative branch can hoist somebody into the executive. That's kind of fun to think about, but I don't know. <laughs> yeah, I think that, and is that what it means on line eight there, that the powers and duties 
are that's the cabinet level yes. powers and duties. Yes. So you define that they are mm -hmm. they have the same powers and duties as yeah. the cabinet level. But yeah, we should talk about how. Yeah, so they, that's right. The intent of that language is really to establish that that's the level they're at. Yeah. But it so just needs to be clear whether they are a member of the cabinet or not. Or not. Yeah. And I don't, yeah, as, not as long as they have the powers and duties, I don't care if they're. And they get cooperation. That's yeah. what I like about page one is their forced yeah. collaboration. Yeah. So you could say something like, and this is not, you'll, you'll come up with something better, but on, in, on line eight, after of this title, uh, uh, and shall um, be housed, uh, and yeah. while housed, Within the cabinet shall operate independently or something. Yeah, like we can. That. I, there is yeah. language we can put. Yeah, as long as yeah. Well, and maybe maybe we don't create it within the executive branch. I mean, I, I don't know how you can. You can't have it both ways, right? Yeah, but we we have a lawyer. She can figure it out. Yeah, I, I, yeah. I think it's either at the cabinet sure. level with the duties and responsibilities and authority of a cabinet level member without being a yeah. member. Yes. Of the Indeed, we can make that clear. I just want yeah. to make sure I got the yeah. answer right. to the committee. Yeah. So right. all house shall operate separately. Okay. I think she can figure out the wording. I feel, I feel good. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Did we settle on the name? No, I don't think we have yet, but we're using that name just because fine, fine. I couldn't think of anything better. And I nobody else, no, nobody else has offered better. I don't know. Where. So, Depends on what the prize is. Diana sent testimony. She has a night in the room. Okay, we'll take that. I testimony of her 30 minutes ago. Anyway, one idea from our group was uh, equity, <coughs> either using the word equity instead of civil rights or human rights instead of. We have civil human rights. rights. Yeah, it seemed, it human seemed rights. like civil rights was. I like civil mainly rights. Mainly to support the. 13th and 14th Amendment, but yeah. this is such a broader task than that. So well, this I would be the that, equity review that, board? Is that what you're thinking? Just, I couldn't come up with no. an ideal title. Maybe no. others here. I, I think yeah. we, we yeah. should Sorry, leave that for right. That Let, yes, let's not get into that right Sorry, now. Let's go through right. the bill. We can always think of a, a name, but we need to get through the concepts first. Okay. So I'll move on to 5002, still on page 2 here, the new language in subdivision A um, provides that the panel has to consult with the Governor's Workforce Equity and Diversity Council and the Vermont Human Rights Commission and others, and that the panel has the administrative, legal, and technical support of agency administration. Um, changes, top of page 3, just a couple of clarifying changes that no appointees to the panel shall be a legislator. And then subdivision two there on line seven and eight that changed some, some other language that nobody liked to provide that the appointees to the panel have to have experience working to implement racial justice reform. Okay. And we, I, I'm struggling with this, but uh, it was pointed out that we should be intentional that appointees be people of color, at least some number of them, but I don't know how we do, but how do you do that because there's five appointing entities? Yeah, I guess we're going to have to get together and figure it out. We, didn't we make that change? Yeah. But you, can't, who are, you can't say the one appointed by the Chief Justice shall be a person of color and the one appointed by the Senate shall not be a person of color. That's what his point is. How do you guarantee the three of them will be? You just figure it out, and if they aren't, you annex them. But well, who we mixes don't have what? The, we, we don't do. have the right to mix anybody. Well, so I'll figure it out. I, I, I don't know. Okay, well, it's not in here. It is isn't. I a week, oh, I, I thought we so. agreed to that. I That's why we're talking about it. That's why we're that. talking about it, because it's oh. not here. Okay. Right. Three? At least so, three? We hadn't yes. gotten that far. And I think that we might want to also say that there should be geographic representation, or some geographic diversity or something, because I don't think we want them all from Wyndham County or all five appointees from Chittenden County. But most of state government is within, I mean, a vast, yeah. large percent of state government is in Washington and Chittenden County. This has nothing to do with where they're from. No, I know, but if you're looking at systemic racism within state government, that that, that is where a large number of it state is. government people are. 
Well, we can talk about that. I would like to say that there should be geographic representation or geographic diversity or however we want to say it. But, yeah. <clears throat> Subdivision 3, I'm now halfway down the page. This um, adds some new language that provides that the terms of the panel members have to be staggered, and we changed it to three-year terms. Um, and it also provides, I highlighted this, that members shall not serve more than three consecutive terms in any capacity. I did not catch if the committee wanted to go with three consecutive terms or two. Oh, sorry. Three. Yeah. That's fine. Subdivision four, I changed the chair's term from two to three years, so it lined up with the terms of the panel members. Have we, have we addressed how we appoint people when they leave the panel? So if it was the legislative yeah, appointment, does the legislature appoint the refill? Yeah, so we for, did put it in there. If you see there on lines 10 and 11, um, its yeah. terms expire, yeah. appointments of successors. Oh, okay, yeah, good. Thank you. And then, so now bottom of the page, Subsection C, this is a whole new subsection that sets out the duties of the panel. Um, and the first is to work with um, agency of administration on the request for proposals, seeking competitive bids, provide a comprehensive organizational review to identify systemic racism in each of the three branches of state government. So that's the RFP language. Um, and then two is to appoint the chief, and three is to work with the chief to implement reforms based on the comprehensive organizational review. Um, this is on the panel. This is the panel. So yes. the panel works with the chief to implement the reforms, but I mean, that's true, but it's more like a board of directors in a sense, yeah. right? I mean, the chief is the staff, so I don't know, it's, it seems funny to me to think of them working to implement as opposed to, I, I, get, I mean, I'm happy for that to be there, but I, I, we haven't sort of said to advise, to, to sort of, you know what I mean? I, I guess I'm trying to, we're, to we're, direct, we're you could, to they would even, forth. and in fact they would be directing the chief, this is really where yeah. the guts of the independence comes from, right? Where, yeah, where are the, I mean, I think that that's the, the maybe, point maybe is that they are, um, and we can flesh that out a little bit because I think that is. Um, I think you need a fourth one there to, to say what its ongoing work is after, you, I mean, it's, yes, it's to it, Im, implement the, the results of the, the review, but then in an ongoing fashion, it's meant to, to work with the chief uh, Whatever, on whatever else they're going to be taking up. So it could address ongoing work. It, it really is an advisory board. I mean, it's, it's direct, kind of directing the, the person. Um, it's identifying the priorities with, and, then, and then... Well, working with the, the consultant is going to identify um, the systems that exist. Oh, and the other thing, oh, we haven't gotten to the consultant yet. About there. Let's flag okay. that and then okay. figure out what else we want to add. But are we all agreed that we want to set them up as essentially like a board of directors to the executive director? Yeah. Yeah. And we could call it a board. I called it a panel instead of a board, but it could be board of, it could be board. I don't care what it is as long as we understand what it is. Whatever is the best word to use. I don't know if there's a difference legally between boards and directors and panels and I don't know. Well, a, a board of directors advises, uh, directs and helps set priorities, but it doesn't micromanage. So there's this fine line between advising, directing, and helping set priorities and then not micromanaging. You know, good board. A good board hires the right person and then lets them go and enables them and does all these things, advising, directing, helping set priorities, but doesn't. And provide oversight. Mm -hmm. And oversight, yeah. Okay. Okay. okay, I'll flag that as something to return to. 
or just as a fourth that we need a fourth and another okay. fourth. And implement, even if we leave number three implement. Yeah, I think, yeah. I think those are all great. I just think we need a fourth, I agree. Okay. <clears throat> okay, bottom of the page, sub section F here provides, this is the language on removal of the chief, provides that they can remove only for cause, and it also directs the panel to adopt the rules um, based on how to define the basics and process for removal of the chief. Now that was language I might have mentioned earlier, but it was back in the moment <coughs> when the governor yeah. was appointing. Yeah. So that was, to me, a protection for the, of the independence of the person. Now that it's all squarely underneath the, what we're calling the panel for a minute, I don't know. I, I'd actually suggest we take that out. I think, well, that, I think you can put only the panel shall remove, may remove the chief, the person, yes. and the panel shall adopt rules to define the basis and process for removal. Yeah. Then that's take out. Right. I mean, they're, they're, we're empowering them. Yeah. 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 To hire so and fire. They could fire. Yeah. For yeah. Something stronger than that. Okay. Okay. Thank you. So turning to page five, now I'm in the duties of the chief. <clears throat> so sub A sets out the duties of the chief, um, and it provides that using that comprehensive organizational review conducted by the vendor. Um, as a basis, the chief shall implement a program of continuing coordination and improvement of activities in state government in order to combat systemic racial disparities and measure progress toward fair and impartial govern governance. So that's all new. Yep. Um, sub B, I've just added a cross-reference to the cabinet duties statute. And then same language, the state agencies have to work collaboratively with the chief and provide records. Sub C, this is also all new, and it provides that the chief, um, it provides the chief with power to subpoena, compel testimony, and require document production. And there's a whole bunch of language here that sets out the guidelines for proper service of a subpoena or notice to produce. And then if you turn to page six, subsection D, this provides for an administrative penalty of $2,000 per day if a person is not compliant with the subpoena or notice of production. I also like the part where they can be compelled to stop doing business <laughs> <laughs> yes. on state lines 10 and 11. Yeah, it also provides that the chief yeah. can recommend to the appropriate licensing authority that the person's license should be revoked if they are not compliant. So, so, so help me understand this. This is different from the the, um, the uh, Human Rights Commission because they're not handling complaints so much, right? They're they're looking at systems mm -hmm. and they're looking at practice. So I could see where we need them to have the power to subpoena if you know some agency was not basically cooperating. Mm -hmm. But who would, who do we, paint me a picture where someone might fail to appear. How, how does that, I mean I can see that somebody fails to appear, but, but how does this role work? In that sort of quasi-judicial yeah. fashion, where you can set a hearing or a, a meeting and have them fail to appear. Well, it wouldn't be a hearing because they're not the well, the person is trying to get at systems changes, and um, I I don't know how this would work in a I can see how the subpoena you need to give me those records you need to give me this you need to cooperate right but I I, I don't know how that works you can right so it does give it does give this person um, sort of an, an investigative authority um, to which say, they need. Right, to be able to um, administer an oath to a person and say everything that you say has to be truthful and essentially take um, testimony from that person. And, um, and if a person fails to appear in order to give their testimony, 
then it authorizes the chief to impose these um, the administrative um, the administrative fee and the other consequences for non-compliance. So um, in that regard, I think it's similar because it sort of imparts an investigative authority on this person. Um, and I put this together sort of in response to the committee's desire to have give some teeth to the chief. Yeah, no, for sure. Um, so this, <laughs> so uh, that was poetry teeth to the chief. Um, so, but I understand if it is too much of an investigative um, jurisdiction for this person, since I understand also that your idea is that they really be working to implement change, and perhaps it's the. Um, Responsibility of the consultant to do the investigative work. Well, I think both. I think that the, this person also needs to have the ability to to do that. I, um, I mean, maybe it's I okay. Suppose, yeah, well, well, let's we'll, we'll sit for a little bit and keep going. I, because I, 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 I think you have given them teeth, but and we aren't fully clear on all the ways in which this will play out and what people will have to do to get things if they're embedded and if they aren't yeah. clear to me how it will work out. Okay. 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 It may hit a real barrier that you have to <coughs> Okay, so I'll move on to sub E now, halfway down the page. <clears throat> this is that language on performance measures, um, and I have in my notes based on conversation at the last hearing that this language might change, uh, but it's relatively the same for now. But we did add in all three branches of government that the chief has to establish performance measures for. And then subdivision F, this is the part about the Department of Human Resources and conducting trainings. So just um, add some additional language here that in addition to conducting its regular trainings, the Department of Human Resources has to work with the governor's workforce um, to conduct trainings based on the recommendations of the chief. And then there's some language on page seven that nothing shall be, nothing in the subsection shall be construed to discharge the existing duty of human resources to conduct trainings. I'm sort of double down there on that. Um, I'm trying to make it clear that they, this is outside the scope of its regular responsibilities. I, I like what we're doing here. I wonder just the organization. To me, the chief would be uh, designing trainings to push down, you know, after getting data and the survey of the whole scene, there would be trainings, right? That's, that's right. part of what we think is necessary and so I guess I wonder if I would just put the onus on the chief I mean it's maybe it's nitpicky but here you're sort of talking about HR is already doing some and now they got to consult with the chief as opposed to you tell me which paragraph yeah we're right. bottom of page six okay oh you've gone back I thought we'd move forward no this is <laughs> just precisely where we are no, okay. F, in addition to conduct his regular trades HR shall work with mm -hmm. but I'm, I'm sort of wondering to, to me that the chief would create trainings based on the measuring and the data that is coming forward and work with HR and anybody else to get them into practice. So does that? Yeah, I think it. Maybe, oh yeah. yeah. I, I would think that the, the person would be working with HR and with the agencies and departments to develop the, the yeah. training because the, the person can't do it by him or herself without knowing the agency that they're dealing with. So they might be different in different agencies and working with HR and the individual agencies to develop to help develop training. Okay. Is what I would say. Yeah. And, and this will be the heart and the most expensive part of this uh, uh, of this work is the is the real training that's going forward. And that's where it's Remember our conversation about how costly training would be and how the HR at the moment doesn't have the resources to do that. This would be really focused additional training, and we need to really put our money where our mouth is in that regard and helping enable that. Okay. Everything 
Anything with audits in this? I can't remember. Are we going to audit that committee or? Well, in the in so much as they're creating data points and measuring it and reporting annually, it's not a it's not an independent audit. But I think as I hear it, the panel is providing at an annual measurement. An annual report. So I'm not the same as an audit. I'm just saying after it gets going for a while, audit to see if it's made well, any difference. Wouldn't the auditor well, step up to the plate on that? Where we um, you can choose some, but or you can ask them to have a robust, just right. to make up a word that nobody ever uses, on the function. Well, I mean, no. I think we have talked about the panel measuring progress. I mean, very clearly. That's right. We talked about. So, I think that's uh, oh, somewhere right. Whatever. Yes. Three. Okay. The performance measures language. Yes. Yeah. yeah. That's on. I, I, here. When you go back to. On line on page six, then the, yeah. that section. 14 and 14. I, I think that it needs to be clear that the person has to work with the um, agencies and departments to help, and with the chief performance officer to help create those um, performance targets and measures. Because um, the instead, it can't be an independent. Um, I mean, it can't be something that the person does in isolation. It has to be done right. with. With chief the individual departments and agencies, okay, and and I believe with the chief performance officer, so that because she might already have data that she can um, that she knows is there and can have suggestions about what is collectible and what isn't. So, okay. and sadly, measuring success is well, it's not going to be immediate. It's going to take time. Well, no, I, I think that was sort of the point. I mean, maybe we would consider that the audit function, but just to see if we're actually making progress from a completely absent. I, I would. I wouldn't ask for an audit here. If well, you ask for an audit, it's just going to have lots more money attached to it. Well, I think it's valuable to just read lines fourteen through eighteen, on page six. Mm -hmm. Yes, yeah. we're looking at. It. But a lot of places do reports, like bio. You know. And it right. doesn't mean that you can tell how they're doing from reading the reports. Well, it gives them some indication. But, what was, what yeah, I was but, envisioning was someone like our auditor, who seems like a pretty smart guy, when they're setting up their stuff with Susan Zeller, looking at ways, data that they should keep track of, that he might be useful in saying, well, you know, we could, there's a way to check on this, because there's a different, there's, Performance criteria and there's audits. I don't know if they're the same, and I don't know that we need them, so I'm not going to talk about. Well, it he anymore, does performance audits. He right. does more than financial audits, and he That's does performance audits, and we could ask him to do a performance audit in but, two years or in a year. Yeah, it may well, be premature, sure and we're going to be revisiting yeah. this in the next year or two, and and, and 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 I think there is a distinction that in your vital example, vital writes the report. Right. In this example. The panel writes the report, sort of measuring different agencies in the administration. So there's, you know, it's not the Secretary of Ed who writes the report. It's so. Okay. It's a little dis difference that I think. Yep. Anyway. Okay. So I'm I'm on page seven now. Subdivision G, lines four and five. This is the annual reporting requirement from the chief. Um, I wanted to flag this as an area where you could get specific about what it is that you'd like the chief to report on. Um, now it just says that they'll report. He or she will report. But um, this is where any um, any specifics should, would go. Do we mean it to be the chief and not the panel? That's what I was wondering. In conjunction the with the paid person, right? Yeah. The panel are volunteers. Yeah, but right? yeah. chief's going to write the right report yeah. anyway. <laughs> but I think it. It, it could come. The chief's going to write it, but it could come from the panel. Yeah. The, That's what I like. The Human Rights Commission. That's how they do it. Sends a so, report. 
by that parent writes it. <laughs> but it is a difference. Yeah, to make sure that the person doesn't write the report and not, never even run it by. Doing a great job, yeah. Yeah. I, I do. Okay. Then you could just say the chief in conjunction with the panel. No, I wouldn't no, say that the panel. panel is the one that submits the report. They're gonna hire they're gonna have the chief write it, yeah. but it's the panel that submits the report. Just like the task force, when we set up a task force on alimony reform, yeah. the task force is the one that submitted the report, but it was the ledge council, council person that wrote it. But they said they were the ones that submitted the report. I don't know. I think that's a distinction without. Uh, I'll tell you. I don't know why that's It important. is and it isn't because it's five names that have to be attached to it, right? Oh. And the chief, and those five names come from distinct places. So it it, it to me speaks to a level a of buy. Buy it. That is big buy. I agree with that. Okay. To me, that would report would have the five names anyway. So, be foolish not to have. Can I just uh, ask a follow up question about that? On page six, the language we were just talking about the performance measures, would you like the performance measures to go to the chief or to go to the panel or both? Well, these are coming from district agencies, right? Yeah. Yes. I would, if this person was really doing the job that I anyway think they should be doing, that person would be going to the panel and saying, look, if these are the, these are the kinds of indicators that the agency of environment, natural resources is talking about. Do these make sense to you? Can you see anything here that should be changed that might be different and then working with so that the chief person is the kind of liaison between the panel and the agency department and working with both of them to help develop those. I, I don't know how you say that here except that I would think that if the panel hires this person and the person never comes back to them to, to so it, they would get rid of the person. Right. Anyway I would if I were on that panel. Right. So I don't know that we have that. Okay. Okay, so let's see, section four. I'm back on page seven now. <clears throat> oh, this is this is not new. This is just the authorization for the position and then the appropriation. Section six is new. This is um, a bunch of provisions here that came out of the conversation about the RFP and the timeline for the RFP and the hiring of the chief. So sub A says that by September 1st, the Civil Rights Advisory Panel has to be appointed. Sub B says that um, by November 1st, the Secretary of Administration, in consultation with the Civil Rights Advisory Panel, shall issue the RFP. Um, to solicit bidding on a comprehensive organizational review to identify systemic racism in each of the three branches of state government. And then the next sentence provides that that report has to be given, um, completed and given to the Secretary of the Panel and the House and Senate DevOps committees on or before March 1st of 2020. So, sorry, I, I, I just don't understand why we're uh, hiring a, a chief a civil rights person after we do the RFP. I guess I had thought that the chief would be helping shepherd this whole process and doing the professional follow-up with the panel through the whole RFP process and then figuring out how to implement its recommendations. I, I I think that when I when I talk to the right. when I that isn't the way I understood it. When I talk to the administration and when I think about this, there is a um, there might be we need to do an inventory of the agencies and the departments and see what the issues are, what the 
systems issues are that are in place that create um, discriminatory actions or racially motivated actions. We need to do an inventory of that, and that is what the um, I understood that the consultant would do is that they they would do that, and that the and they don't have they're not going to implement anything. That person isn't going to do anything. They're going to look at the systems that we have in place and say, here are some real <coughs> issues in the system, and we need to and make an inventory of those, and then you hire the chief of the chief of civil rights or whatever we call that person to take that list of here are 127 different things that need to be changed in these agencies and departments and start implementing those and start working as a cabinet member to say Department of Agency of Natural Resources you have to do this this is one of the issues that you have yeah no, I, I, I understand that process but I had assumed that we would have a chief civil rights officer shepherding that work I mean because a consultant is not going to be full-time and they're hired they're they a part-time person outside of state government um, I had just always assumed there would be a professional at the helm of this <laughs> uh, review. I would call it a review rather than an inventory because it, it, it's a study of what uh, of systemic right. of a system of s systems. Right. So it's a study, um, and but to me, the chief needs to be there to be the glue that makes it all happen and is the interface with the panel and with the state government, with the cabinet. Uh, it, I, I guess I always had thought there would be a chief put in place. That would be the first thing the panel would do would be to hire the chief. And then they together would uh, do the RFP and, and um, do that work together. If we'd had a chief, why would we need to hire a consultant? We wouldn't. We would just hire. We would because just hire somebody. Different skills. Well, they are they different are skills. Totally different skills, right? And that's why that's why we put the consultant first. To, that was the. Uh, I, I thought it made yeah, sense. It was the recommendation of the administration to put that first and then create the position afterwards. And it made sense to me, Chris. I, I guess I um, I've been struggling with the idea of the consultant mm -hmm. as opposed to just hiring the chief. You know, I, maybe there are different skills, but it also might have a lot of value to have the chief, you know, just starting and, and seeing the whole thing from day one. I mean, uh, um, and not hiring a consultant. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, I would hire a consultant because these are different skills. I mean, well, one why, is why do you say that? I mean, oh, because I think. There are professional consulting groups that you hire to do specific work, and and a person can be a good manager and a good implementer and a visionary, but they aren't necessarily skilled at going and designing a a a format for review. I mean, this is a huge undertaking to to review systemic racism in state government. That's a big project, mm -hmm. and you have to design it. You have to figure out how it's going to be. Uh, all its measures and how it how it's going to work. I mean, that those are very. That's a statistical data person who gets the vision from the panel and the chief, and then figures out how to go at finding it out. It's a, I think, a very different skill set. And HR can speak to this better than I can because you hire consultants for specific purposes. But to me, that's a, you know, those are very different skill sets. Well, Am I? I thank you, Otto. I guess we're, we, first of all, I'd like us to call out data more plainly. In yeah, a sense. I um, had written that too, but, that we needed to. But we are starting, I don't even think that we know what data we need to collect. And so, um, I mean, you know, it's it's not really a one-person job, but that's just the reality of yeah, where we sit. So I don't know. I, I I need to be convinced that this this two-step process makes sense. That that a chief, I mean, 
maybe the panel would decide that we need a new kind of chief after a while, but but it just seems to me, I don't know, it just I've never been settled about this consultant versus chief timeline. So I'm um, also the lines here are blurry for me. Once the panel is put together, their first job, as I understood the way it was put together, would be to do the uh, request for proposal. Mm -hmm. Then after they've got a vendor <laughs> picked, they hire the chief. After the study is done. Correct. Yeah. Yeah, so then the, what does the panel do after that? They act in an ongoing board of directors. But it doesn't ever say that in here. Well, well that's what we have to add that one. That's okay. what we're going to be talking so about. So that was one thing. Yeah. And what is yeah. their relationship with um, state agencies and departments? Do they have any contact with them at all? Or is that strictly something that the chief does? Good question. Mm -hmm. I'm just still trying to kind of figure out who's doing what and how they can all come together and get anything done because mm -hmm. oh. that's all. Mm -hmm. You know, we're not professionals in this area, you know, so I'd really love to, we have some professionals in this area uh, with us and uh, it would just, and you know, we have Carrie and we have uh, Beth and we have Tom and I mean, and I'm sure, and 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 mm -hmm. Karen, who have, uh, who know when they need help to identify uh, something, uh, that they would hire a consultant. Could, so, if you could speak to why you would hire someone independent of the panel and the chief to do the work of mm -hmm. identifying systemic racism, you know, could you would you speak to that and help us understand and. De blur the lines can, for us. Can we first of all make oh, sure that we've gone through the bill so that Bryn can doesn't have to sit there with us and we can get people to sorry testify. I, I mean I got sucked down the substance block, you know. I just want to make sure that we understand everything that's in the bill here before we Okay. Okay. I'm almost done. The the last change is on page um, eight. So subdivision C provides that the um, Department of Human Resources has to provide an interim report. Um, I left committee without knowing what you wanted that interim report to be about. I apologize. So I have that little question mark there um, to get some clarity on that. Whether it was to report on trainings or... Mm. Yeah, I, I don't know what we meant either. So. Okay. Very good company. <laughs> it was one of the things that was thrown out. I don't know that it was ever put okay. out. Okay. I'll, I'll deal with that. And then D provides that by February 1st of 2019, the panel has to have nailed down the contract. And E provides that by July of 2020, they have to hire the chief. And then the effective dates we just changed to the passage. But I understand we might change that as well. <coughs> Any more questions for Bryn? Thank you. Thank you. And this, I, I will admit to me, this is really hard. I mean, we're setting up something, mm -hmm. a process here that's really hard. And, that, and, and as I see it, we have, there's a balance here between having it as independent as possible, but the whole process, the panel, and the, and yet having the authority to compel agencies and departments to do something. Right. Th that there is that balance there, and if it's too independent and has no relationship to state government, then it can't compel that. If it's too tied into state government, then it could be end up being directed there. So right. I I don't know the the right balance exactly and I don't um, really pretend to have any answers here I do and I will say that just realistically um, we are looking at probably between 125 and 150 thousand dollars in the budget and we I'm willing. I, we put that in there, but I do not. I don't think we can put both in both a um, consultant and a position in well, the same and budget. The, That's and the study. I mean, the study itself is going to take uh, 
have additional costs and expenses. We need to get a, uh, a fiscal note on this with... Um, Why would the study take additional money? Because it takes money to run a study. You're, you're paying a consultant $125,000 to do it. Uh, well, in addition, you have a, the panel you're paying. I know it all be at $100 a day. Isn't it? 50 well, well maybe, where I was, I was hoping we would actually do it and I don't think we will. And just slowly embed a, a civilized amount of money to give a day to state government. Um, so, I, but, you know, I think that's cheap at half the price. I mean, I think that's an amazing, I, 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 I'd rather ask more and get more. And, I mean, I guess we have to, so, I would love to hear from our professionals about the the, cha the challenge we're feeling or the tension we're feeling between hiring a chief first and then working with and helping hire a consultant and design that. I mean, to me, that's a chick. That that is. Um, I, I think you need leadership, and I, to hire leadership to make this all happen. Panel isn't going to do that as a volunteer panel on its own. I, I just want us to be really aware of the money, and I hate to say this, but we are, um, as we heard at noon, there are a lot of pressures on this budget. We are cutting out services for the developmentally disabled. We're cutting services for... We aren't doing that yet. The we government, aren't doing the that yet. has asked to do that, but we have right. not done that yet. But I'm, I'm right. just saying but that... But after we don't do that, it's even harder, right? Right, because then we have to find that money. So so I'm trying really hard to be... to balance right. I all of these things. And, and I... I uh, mine might be wrong, but I don't see any reason why some we can't do that kind of a survey for 125 dollars or $150,000. Well, we, I mean, we need a, a fiscal note but from somebody who's done that kind of a study to find out what it really costs instead of just in creating a number out of thin air. I mean, I, I, well, we, look, you have a whole wall of professionals okay. over there who can give you that, give us a notion, and maybe J JFO could give us a, no a notion of what the last big study was that was done in state government, or you guys can. I mean, I don't know what it would cost to do this. Okay, can some, uh, who would like to testify first? Who would, Curtis, would you like to come up here and, um, thank you. Good afternoon, for the record, my name is Curtis Reed, Jr., Executive Director of Vermont Partnership for Fairness University. And, uh, also, by way of introduction, um, in my former life, uh, I spent nearly 20 years as an international development professional running major projects uh, overseas that dealt with issues of corruption, creating the private sector, uh, and the, the conversation you're having around consultant versus um, having uh, your chief of party installed first is um, sort of part of my bailiwick in terms Great. of uh, <laughs> Your experience. Help. experience. Uh, the, the very first thing that your consulting team will ask you will be, who's my point person? And if you don't have a point person, uh, then the, the study gets confused. Uh, so you really want to have the, your chief of party, your chief of executive officer uh, in place uh, to serve as a liaison um, between the consulting team and um, government agencies. Um, otherwise, the, the work gets diffused, the, the communications uh, you know, between that team and state government gets diffused and we have um, and that gets you off to a rocky start. Um, the, um, and you need to have a consulting team. team. Uh, you need to have you know, someone you know, who's an expert around data collection analysis development. You need to have someone who's an expert around um, 
um, systems approach to uh, organizational development. Uh, you need to have someone most likely um, given that a large share of, of, of government operations is around social services. Uh, so someone who uh, has experience looking at uh, systems as they relate to the delivery of, of social services. You need to have an economist uh, for that part of state government that's, that's really looking outwardly to sort of attract. So anyway, so it, it won't be a single individual who will um, you know, complete this assessment. Um, <coughs> and if one individual steps up and says, well, I can do it alone, you know that they're selling you great goods. But isn't, Curtis, isn't that likely to be, we hire a consultant, they have a team, team in place. Yes. I mean, they right. in the consulting. Uh, if you hire right. McKinsey, McKinsey comes McKinsey. with, yes, your yes. point person is one person, but McKinsey has the team of right. analysts, right. Exactly. Uh, data people, social science people. They, I mean, that's what consultants, right. big consulting okay. firms who are capable of this huge challenge. What I, what I heard was, when I heard consultant, that it was in the context of an individual yeah, as opposed fine. to consultant firm. Consulting firm, okay. Um, you know, I, I think the panel, once the RFP is done, uh, it's hired, or it's hired the chief, then the RFP serves as a sounding board for the chief. Uh, that in terms of implementation, um, the chief is charged with implementation, but you know the chief may not know state government or may not know Vermont. If you, you know, bring someone, if they bring someone in from Vermont state, uh, and so they'll need to have uh, those kinds of eyes and ears to guide uh, those relationships. And and because the chief was there at the very beginning, um, can in fact. Uh, Because the, the chief would have been there from the very beginning, the advisory board um, will have an opportunity to see how he or she sort of functions, um, you know, in the kind of the, the dynamic relationship between uh, individuals and, and, and agencies, uh, and that would be really valuable uh, to have uh, for for the chief for the advisory. This advisor would get to do that. Uh, let's see here. I think geographic diversity is really important. We need to have folks from all over the state. This is not simply, you know, Chittenden County or Washington County Center. Um, and you know, you, you know, the 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 bringing on three uh, persons of color into this panel, uh, you know, is. Is, um, it might might be. I don't know how you would write that into the in, in, into the text, given that you have five separate agencies that are mm -hmm. are mandating or that are, that are sending people. Um, you know, but you can send a really strong message that you know the Rooney Rule is, is to be applied, um, and that you know we really want to have <coughs> sort of um, ethnic racial diversity. Representative. Uh, remember, during the Douglas administration, at one point he had failed to appoint a person of color on, on the Human Rights Commission. Yes. And you know how that kind of blew up in his face. Um, that you know this is a commission that's really focused on reducing racial disparities. Uh, so it would stem to reason that the majority of panelists um, would be from ethnic racial minority groups. around training. Um, you know, there's, there's training done around systems, systems change. Uh, I'll take the example of sort of state police. Um, in, in terms of getting reliable data, uh, have had to train and retrain troopers on how to do data collection. You know, how to, you know, what do you, 
what are you checking on your, on your traffic ticket? Uh, and that is an excruciating, has been an, an, ex, an excruciating process um, because you know they've always done it the way they've always done it, and now we're asking them to do it in a different way, and that different way, uh, in some and in some cases, has conflicted with sort of the culture that state police, some state troopers have grown up in. Um, so, um, you know, we've got systems training, we've got training on, you know, around inclusion and equity, uh, and then there are likely to be some, some technical training. Uh, you know, I'm thinking of AHS and Department of Health, thinking of, you know, um, motor vehicles, you know, are all mm -hmm. sort of ripe for, um, for uh, other types of training that are outside of systems or outside of, of in inclusion. Interfacing with public. Right. Uh, so, but I really like the, the uh, draft 2.2 and the direction that it's, that, that it's moving in. Um, but I think that in terms of the big question of do you hire a chief first uh, or simultaneously with the RFP uh, that you really need to have the chief in place uh, for it to be an effective process. Um, does any consulting team, once it's solved, the very first question will be, who's my interface? And if that interface is within state government, the administration, which is will be the object of, yeah. right. of the study, uh, you, you lose credibility. So I would say chief, then uh, RFP. Any questions? It's a fair point, and I've done consulting work, and it's always hardest when the, the client yeah. is not clear what they want, or you only get out what you ask for. Mm -hmm. uh, but we do face uh, fiscal challenges that you know mean that we don't the five of us are not going to get everything we want. Um, do, do, could, you, could you structure it where the chief was not full-time for the first year? If we're, trying to, if we're trying to get this, I mean, if we, you're saying clearly that you need outside expertise more than one person for, right. uh, to get launched. Correct, and to have the chief as simply for the first year, the point of contact, as opposed to implementation, you could scale that back to you know, ten percent, fifteen percent over the first year. So the the only responsibility of the first year would be to be the that point person to work with the agencies and the the panel or the board or whatever and the. Right, to serve as the liaison between the consulting team and, or between the consultant and state government. Well, I was just thinking it might be hard to find somebody to work ten, one tenth time. Yeah, <laughs> really. I think you're either going to yeah. do it. Yeah, um, I mean, we, I mean, we, 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 yeah, the people with those kinds of skills aren't exactly a dime a dozen, and mm -hmm. yeah, I'm worried about that. So I, I, I think nothing ventured, nothing gained. I think we find out the true cost of doing this properly, and we advocate for it. I, it it's, it's a tough budget year, but this is a top priority uh, for the state and for this administration and for this legislature, I think. Um, I, I don't, so I, I think that we should have guts and go, go for what it really is gonna cost. I would love to get a sense from a consulting firm and when you said people, I think you meant a consulting firm that has a bunch of expertise embedded in it. Right. Again, a point person from that consulting firm, mm -hmm. but like a McKinsey or you know any one of the great consulting houses, they're going to have a lot of expertise embedded in them. Um, I'd love to get a sense from, uh, again, from all of you of the last uh, consulting firms you hired to do things. Uh, you know, just get a sense of what it costs to do something. <coughs> Uh, and I think maybe one of the, the HR and Carrie and Karen maybe can give us a, 
notion of that, but also I, we can find out from JFO because they hire uh, consulting firms to do studies for them also, and they, we can get a sense of what it would cost. But I think this is a really major project of state government, and I think we shouldn't, I think we should start with what we need, and if it means we have to do it in phases and have to do it, you know, a little more slowly because of financial constraints, fine, but I don't think we should start with the constraints. I think we should start with what we want and then see where it is, see where it goes. But if we don't ask for it, we'll never get it. Chris? Well, I'll just say I'm a big fan of not negotiating with ourselves and limping out of here. I agree with that. I also doesn't seem impossible to me to believe that we could get nothing. Mm -hmm. yeah. And and that would we'll face I that. would much rather get uh, fifty percent perfect and get something um, started. So I, you know, which is just to say the balance is uh, difficult to figure out. I think that I think that the when you talked about phasing it in, I think that's exactly what the thought was here that you would phase it in. You would have. And I get the point, the, the um, issue of having a contact person and having a point person. But the, the thought was that you would start with, because we have two, really two major expenses here. Right. We have the chief or the executive director or whatever we want to call this person, and we have a cons consultant. consultant. The consultant. And, and the well. thought was to phase them in, to start with one. <clears throat> and then go for the other one. Now we can start with the executive director and have that person on board for a year and then do the consulting, but I'm not sure what the, the without that fair. inventory and that systemic well, look at the systems, that right, that would right. be and wise. One of the things the World Bank does is that they commission a study first, but then based on the outcome of the study, that informs the profile for the executive. Right. I mean, that's, so that's, that's part of what, what is here. That's so funny. what if we, sir? Yeah, well, I was yeah. just trying to think out loud. Um, if you had the chair of the panel yeah. be, the point, be person. the point person. That's an alternative, yes. yes that's a good now chair. you haven't spent any money yet. Right. Yeah, but you have a volunteer. And then we have data-driven recommendations coming from a consulting firm that we hire. Mm -hmm. And you still have time later on to hire the chief after you have all the data and the report is finished. That might be the best. You could, you could actually, um, some towns on their select boards pay their select board $600, yep. but they pay their chair $1,200. Right. I mean, you, you could have some kind of a small stipend for the chair that would be the point. your 10% person, but they're, the they're doing it as the chair of the board instead of, because mm -hmm. to ask some, because you might not want to hire somebody at 10% and then you really want to hire them at 100% later on, but now they've gone off to another job because you couldn't guarantee them. Right, so. right. Yeah, I, I like that alternative. Yeah, that's, you are so well, smart. Uh, no, because I think Senator Clarkson uh, might not agree with that. Um, I just think to ask a volunteer to do that is a huge ask. Well, but we've just said maybe we could pay him a little. Yeah, no, no, I, I, yeah, I think that's I think that's an idea. I think that the additional thing that Curtis maybe assumed but didn't mention is that with a CEO of this or with the chief comes the vision too. I mean, you hire a leader, you know, you hire a chief mm -hmm. to have vision about something, and that vision helps drive this whole process also. I know the panel will have it as well, but. It, am I mm -hmm. wrong in thinking that? And for me, that's really what, why you hire somebody, is to hire somebody who has leadership skills, who has management skills, and who really, first and foremost, has vision. You need the vision, but the vision needs to come from the panel. Yeah. And the vision can come from the panel through the development of the study. consultant mm -hmm. who figure it out which then drives what you need in the chief. Right. Because, because you might need it. We might be barking up the entirely wrong tree about what this person should be, and it might be after some initial work that the person needs to be a bulldog or needs to be a, 
a really sweet night. I mean, we don't know, and I think that'll come from. So give me an idea, Curtis, if you can, mm -hmm. of what it would cost to consult with a, and I'm saying person here, but right. if, it's, if, if it's an individual person, they're going to ha use other people. There's no one single person that's going to right. bid on this without backup people. That's so right. Right. how much, are we talking about $150,000? I'm just um, text, I'm just emailing Steve Klein to say, okay. would you be kind enough to give us a notion of what uh, consultants have cost? Okay. For well, I'm asking Curtis yeah, yeah. because he's done it. Um, right, I would say 150 is a is a good ballpark figure based on our own experience having done this for the City of Burlington. Okay, and just, I see heads shaking over here. Yes, there is. Yeah, so that's nodding. Oh, sh I mean nodding. Okay. Nodding, not shaking. That's <laughs> I see heads moving. <laughs> and a positive. Okay. So you're talking about $150,000 a year. I mean, That's for, that, for, the job. That, for that, for for that, that job. job. And it, for that it is designed to be done in a, Correct. about a year. So, yeah. I think that's going to be low, given the scale of this. But I'm just hurt. So Carrie's it's also a, not a huge smiling it's a ball, over there. It's ball, a big ballpark. It, ballpark, yeah. It could really be a lot more, but it wouldn't necessarily yeah. have to be. I think right. you're in the right number. Right. And and also that would depend on how it was designed. You know, the, the consultant may um, be selective in terms of, of sampling and the way that they collect data. You know, so there are any number of ways that would allow them to meet that budget. Threshold, but if it's you know set at 150 or 175 or whatever, does it help any at all? If, since we told the agency of administration that they have to provide, to provide support and that kind of, I mean, because I think that is in here that they have to provide the. Um, uh, I don't remember. No, it, it isn't in here yet because that was one of the late mm -hmm. comments that got, but. Uh, yeah, that would be part of the whole <laughs> yeah. to, to yeah, the, the what, yeah. what they would have, what they would provide. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, well, maybe maybe we just make it very clear that part of the consultant's work is to identify what else you know. Mm -hmm. We're not going to be able to pay for the full scale service, so you know, leave us a. Uh, at the end of the workload, the next, you know. Right, what are the next what, steps? What do didn't they, you get yeah. to that you really should get to? Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I, I think you go for the, I'd go for the gusto. I think. I, mean, I think you should. <laughs> I you think I'm crazy. We don't but think I, you're crazy, if, not, not if, at all. If you don't awesome. ask for it, you aren't even going to get 50%. So if you ask for what you really want, you might get 50%, and well, then we'll no, figure that out. But. They but, don't always just say a little bit less. They just no. sometimes say, no, you can't have it. But my experience with economic development is if we ask for what we want, we then negotiate with more ardor and, oh, and we get, often get, what we ask for or not that much less. I haven't been disappointed, and we've had this conversation in economic development all the time. We say, well, oh, should we do this? Well, and then we put together a package, we go for it, and we defend it, and we feel strong about it, and we've actually gotten sort of in the one year of non-economic development. We've gotten what we've asked for. So you're right, it's going to, but we also <coughs> may step outside the constraints that we've been given. You know, we may not operate within the constraints the governor has given us. Maybe we'll have a special project section. Of the <coughs> so I just emailed okay. Steve and to get a sense of some of the costs of the last consultant firms that we've hired. Okay. To get a notion, but my guess is that 150 to 250 is probably where we'll be. It's a big job. It's. it's uh... Yes, I mean, if I was to compare this with World Bank projects or USAID or, you know, you're you're you know pushing the the two hundred thousand rank. Yeah. That's given it. given that you're not talking about the entire country, but we're talking about Vermont. Right. 
So you know, there's there's also that that consideration. Eight thousand employee. I mean, it's just a, it's a lot of data. <clears throat> Thank you, Curtis. Any more questions for Curtis? Yeah. And just so that um, the the part that didn't get in here actually about the the because um, I got to print so late about the the consultant would be do, deciding kind of what data needed to be collected and how that data was collected and. And I think there are some um, uh, good, um, some good language that is in the, um, that we got from the Racial Justice Reform Coalition. The, mm -hmm. Some of the language around data collection and stuff is, is in here that we can just lift out of here and, and use. So that, that is part, that would be part of the, the role of that person. I'm um, Thomas Waldman. I'm the general counsel of the Department of Human Resources. Um, I cannot speak to Senator Clarkson's question about cost, what a consultant, what a, what a consultant would cost for this project. Or, um, but what I would like to speak to is the idea of which which comes first. Mm -hmm. uh, I know from the department's perspective, considering the budgetary constraints, it would make sense to bring the consultant on first. Um, because the consultant's work may well steer the direction of who the appropriate candidate for chief would be, uh, and it would certainly, and hopefully, <coughs> um, refine and define what the chief's role is. You know, where the where the where the effort of the chief should be. Um, in terms of a point person, I th I think Curtis's point is excellent. That certainly the consultant would need a point person. Um, whether that point person is the chairperson of the panel or whether the point person is someone within the administration. Uh, I know there's been a lot of, a lot of talk about um, independence, and independence is important, but just as important as independence is the notion that there is buy-in from leadership to affect cultural change. So if, if the chief's role is going to be to implement cultural change, it's really important that the chief be perceived as being, yes, independent, but also having buy-in from, from the administration, from management, from leadership. And I know that that's a big concern um, with, uh, with the draft of the bill as it's set up now. Um, and I know, Senator White, I think you were speaking to this. It's a very delicate balance. Um, to strike, um, the other provisions, for example, about the subpoena power and enforcement of subpoenas. Yes, the the chief needs teeth, but the chief also needs kindness. Um, you know, the, 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 and and needs the buy, and needs buy-in from from leadership. And to set it up as adversarial may not may not be the right model. Because the administration is committed to affecting cultural change. That's really all I have. Any questions? I, I actually think that's a, a good point. The, the penalty section there might be a little off-putting. The, the other part of it, the teeth, is the penalty section might be a little off-putting. I just sound a little less like cooperation than but the, I, I, you know, I, I like your idea of buy-in from the administration. I think that's going to be, and, and how better to do that than have them, like the Secretary of the Administration, until the chief is hired, have the Secretary of the Administration be the point person with which the panel works, with whom the panel works, and the consultant works. I, you know, I think that wouldn't be a bad thing either. I just, wouldn't be my preference, but work. Well. Nothing in this is actually required, right? The administration could do this work if they wanted to. They can hire consultants. They could. They, I didn't so see it in their budget, I think, but yeah. So I, I appreciate their interest in this. It's a very important, but I don't think we should overstate it. I, you know, I mean, I, 
haven't seen the executive order that's asking for this to happen. So. Well, it, the, the um, executive order, there is an executive order, a revision of the executive order um, that created the uh, GWEDC. That's in process. So you may see an executive but sorry, or you will G see an executive the, the workforce and equity. The, yeah, the oh, right, 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 right. Equity right. diversity. That, so. that group. That has and Yeah, I, I just don't see why we would hire a consultant to help us figure out our data points and have them work under the entity that we're trying to measure. And that doesn't make a lot of sense. But. So... I don't see that. Except that when organizations, when, when large organizations undertake this kind of change, very often it is, it is management that hires the consultant to come in to study what's wrong with the organization. Generally, management. Yeah, I mean, it generally is. It's not something that's imposed from outside. It's something that comes from inside. It's organic, usually. Right. Well, I will tell you that the suggestion for a consultant to... Um, and some people as were actually named to me as potential consultants or groups as potential consultants came from the administration. They were the ones that said, what we should do is have the panel work to come up with um, the, what, what the consultant will be doing and then hire the consultant. That, was, that came from the administration. So they are, I believe, willing to, to do that, whether the point person is then the secretary of administration, who is the person who would be working with the advisory panel right. um, to come up with the, with the RFP. Is that how it would be? That's how we have it in here anyway. I, I don't know if it's the secretary of administration that's the point person and it's the chair of the panel in consultation with the, I don't know how that works, but I think we do have to make sure we get the buy-in of the yeah. administration. So, okay. Anything else? Karen? Very good. <clears throat> good afternoon. Karen Richards from the Commission, Human <laughs> Rights Commission. I think I'm getting cold, so sorry. I hope I don't infect anybody. Um, so um, I sent in some written testimony. I didn't realize there was a draft 2.2, so I was looking at 2.1, but I've glanced through it, so I, I will try to tailor my remarks away from the things that I pointed out that you already fixed. Um, Did you bring handouts? Do you want to? Um, I do have. Oh, yeah. So you do yeah. want to distribute those? Okay. Um, um, so in terms of uh, addressing the first question, which is um, the chicken <coughs> egg issue, um, I have a strong feeling about this in terms of having the chief, um, whatever they're called, and please not civil rights officer <laughs> in place, um, ahead of time, because the way that state government works, it will be very, very difficult to do this without having somebody in place who is in charge of this thing. It's just to so, first of all, let's say you have your you do it the way you want to, which is to have this panel come up with your RFP, right? That RFP has to go through the buildings and general services bid process. It had the panel. Somebody has to create a contract with your ultimate um, vendor. Somebody has to negotiate that contract. Somebody has to make sure the AGO um, reviews that contract and approves that contract. And you've got a volunteer board that would be trying to shepherd this through. And I can tell you, my experience with volunteer boards is. They like to show up for meetings, and they're happy to contribute on kind of a, a policy advisory level, but the work is done by the staff, and they don't do any work <laughs> beyond, you know, in the, on the commission, it's deciding the cases. Um, so I, I think you would have a real hard time, and I don't even know if state government, Tom might know this better than I, but whether state government could even do this processing without what they call an appointing authority who would be signing off on this stuff. And it can't be 
like some um, executive staff assistant in the agency of administration, that's not going to work. So it's got to be somebody at a high enough level to do that. So that would be my concern with sort of, so the way that I had sort of conceptualized it was, um, I think there's a lot of work for this chief to do um, out of the gate in terms of just getting, um, you know, hired, figuring out state government, which takes some animal in and of itself, right, how you operate in that. Um, figuring out um, they could work on, I think, some of the things that from the Racial Justice um, Reform Coalition that are, were not in here that I think should be included are development of like a model equity policy for the state. So that person could work on that, for example. They could work on the training piece. They could work on helping to figure out, working with DHR, working with the council to figure out what should the training look like. Um, and that may get tweaked over time once your consultant comes in and tells you what to do. But I think there's a lot of work that that person could do and, and also then do this RFP process and then have the RFP process perhaps pay for it in the 2020 budget so that you have your person on the ground getting everything together and then if you, if you need to you know, spread this out, I would spread it out in the opposite way. Put your person in place, help, have them help figure out what you're doing here and hire the consultant and do that work and maybe put that out into the 2020 budget. So that, that's sort of the way that I have um, conceptualized it. Um, I think um, one of the things that um, Curtis mentioned and I think needs definite repeating is the panel itself needs to be majority people of color. I don't know how you write that, um, but otherwise we are doing to and doing for people of color again, which is what we do all the time, and this needs to be something that's coming from people of color um, to solve these problems, not us. Um, and so I think that's incredibly important, and I think there's a, there was, there's some way to do that, even if it's just that who are all these different people appointing have to talk to each other before they appoint people and make sure they got three people. Right, um, I think it's not that hard to do. Um, let's see. Uh, so not, you have a lot of recommendations here. Yes. <laughs> and not be in the agency of administration. Yes, so um, I, I think that, I, I understand Tom's point in terms of having buy-in, um, but I also think that this, Whoever you put into this job, you're going to want somebody who has the ability to get that buy-in, right? That, that's one of the key things that you're going to be looking for in the person that you hire here is somebody who can work with other agencies, somebody who can get buy-in. And so I think you can solve that without having it sit in the agency of administration. And I think even if it's um, independent and the panel is hiring it and hiring this person and firing this person, if you're sitting in that office... There's going to be you're going to be subject to some amount of political pressure, no matter what. And while I respect that this um, this administration is committed to this work, um, we don't know who might be next, and we don't know whether that commitment continues. And so that's what concerns me, and why and being independent myself and not subject to that kind of political pressure makes it, I can do my job without fear of reprisal. And I think that's a really important um, aspect of so, this. So would you, we, we actually don't have it in the agency of administration. We have it within the executive branch. You wouldn't even do that? No, I think it would be an in, in the executive branch. I just think <laughs> you're you. Yeah, we just have it within the executive okay. branch. Okay. It isn't in the okay. But, but you're right. You're recommending you I, would be having the auditor's office. I was office. recommending that you consider the auditor's office yeah, because a, they um, are um, data crunchers for starters. Um, they look at systems, so they are. But they're well. They also try to get a little appropriations to do uh, to get one more room. I remember a few years ago. To, blew up. Yeah. Okay. So I, I, I mean, if you ever go over there, there's like desks in the hallway. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. Well, anyway, that was just But it's a great idea. idea. I like yeah. it. I, I think that's a kind of wonderful idea. I think that they would have the, the clout in the administration to make the departments. I, I mean, they well, do. They, they have do. the clout to, no. to get what they want. I mean, they get, well, 
Well, all right. I, I think you, I mean, you give them, you give whoever, whoever's in this position, you, you have to give them the clout through their right. powers that are here, right? Um, so let me just move to that, because I think, I had some suggestions that I think would improve that. Um, first of all, I think, I think giving this person subpoena power is a good idea, cause, and, but I would add data to the things that they can subpoena, because right now you have like uh, reports and something, so you want to add data in there so that they can actually subpoena data if they need to. Um, and then in terms of the compelling testimony, that would normally be through a subpoena. So let's say that you had a commissioner or a secretary who would never behave this way, but let's say that they um, wanted to stonewall at this person and didn't want to provide information, that this person would have the authority to subpoena that person to come and testify to them or testify to the panel or whatever process they put in place. Um, about that, um, but I think what you want in terms of, I would get rid of that penalty section because that doesn't, I don't know how you charge a secretary $2,000 a day, um, but I think that under the Administrative Procedures Act, there, there are penalties for failing to abide by a subpoena that's issued by an agency, and that's in um, 3 VSA 809A. And I think you would just want to reference that maybe as your penalty section, that, which would allow the, the chief to go to court to compel that information um, from them um, and to have a court order them to provide the testimony or provide the documents. So I think that would be the way to um, do that without, and then, and then it's a little less oppressive in terms of its, like, <coughs> that, that penalty section in terms of um, making it uncomfortable for people. Um, I think. Oh, and then the only other thing I wanted to throw out there is that I, a lot of the civil rights conferences that I've been going to lately, um, they have been bringing in folks from the Ford Foundation, which is totally focused on issues of racial equity. Yeah. And they are doing some amazing work around, um, with the focus around more changing people's minds about how to think about these issues than around, um, you know, kind of some of the more old-fashioned diversity type training um, where you just try to make people feel guilty and they just get mad and don't. Um, so, yeah, so, I mean, they're trying to really change the way people think about things through conversation and lots of other things, and they might actually um, do some of this work for... N nothing. I mean, I don't know how they're structured, but they um, are interested in working with entities and to come into a state and do a whole full oh. system thing might be very attractive to them. Oh, that's a great idea. So that that would be great. something that is worth thinking about. Um, I bet. I, yeah. I bet we could write a grant to do that. Mm -hmm. Right. If we can apply right. to the Ford Foundation. Right. Yeah. Um, I bet they'd be thrilled to be able to, to help make that. Yeah. I think that would be. I think it'd be really cool. I hear they've um, already approved it. <laughs> so I think that's all the comments that I had that were not already sort of taken so care of. Do you have? Yeah. Just a summary. Your, everybody offers a slight different iteration on this chronology of um, chief consultant. So am I right in hearing your summary of being so, let's just pick a date, but January 1, you bring on the chief, still not the right title, and then they get six months to basically help identify what we would be asking for in the RFP, is that correctly yeah. what you're saying, which just yeah. happens to fit with fiscal year? Right, yeah, and then they, yeah, so they would work on trying to figure out what needs, with the panel, what needs to go into this RFP, what do we really need to look at. Um, I think there is a lot of data that's already been collected from a lot of agencies yeah. around this stuff, so it's not like you're starting totally from scratch, and it might be that, for example, this person could also get going on some systems work um, yeah, right. that they, where we already know there's data showing disparities that need to be addressed, right? Um, so it would be possible for this person to explore grants. Um, right, yeah, or, or well, write a grant to the Ford Foundation. The head of the Ford Foundation is a man of color, and this may, I mean, it's been his priority for a while, and it just what a clever person for you to remember. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I'm actually going to be with him in April. Okay, and I've been really impressed um, with them when, you know, when they come to speak good. at these conferences. I just 
really, um, they're really committed and really on top of this stuff. So. That is a brilliant idea, Cameron. So we would put in, I, I'm trying to think of the logistics of it. Too. We would put in for a position. Half the year. For half, well, no, we put in a position for the whole year, but they'd have half a year to, I mean, we, we're not going to cancel the position. No, 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 I, I'm just saying we yeah. couldn't probably get them hired before right. half, halfway through right. the year. <coughs> I see what you're saying. That so from January to July, so we're putting in half a position for that year. And the consultant work would be done <coughs> in the next, <coughs> excuse me, budget. That's, I just want to make sure that this person get is that. Um, and I know that this balance between having the commitment <coughs> of the administration and having the, uh, in my mind, that is the essential thing about how we <coughs> work out that balance. And, and I do think that it can be done without them being completely independent. It was done in the uh, state police, and apparently it was done in the um, Agency of Transportation. And I know that those, that position in this transportation was fund. It took 20 years, but it was funded by the federal government. They said you've got to do it. <coughs> but I don't think that was the case in the, in the state police. And I think that they, they themselves made a commitment to doing it. And um, so I, I just want to make sure that we have that the right balance here, so that it doesn't seem like it's a confrontational. Position because if it's a confrontational position and we're going to tell you what to do, it's going to meet with sure. so much resistance that we might as well not have it there. Sure. So. Absolutely. Because. Well, I, I I agree with you. There's a delicacy here, but I also think this is where we do well to articulate data. Yes. Better because in some level, we're we're looking for someone to manage the data and the data will tell the story you know and so mm -hmm. just an, it's mm -hmm. and and so to me the um i come back to the chief being more independent because because when the data is presented then then people are going to have to make hard decisions and that's where it's a rubber meets the road kind of scene. I mean, you know, I, I think we do look at this, the police all the time. The legislature compelled that data collection. Right. You know, it wasn't mm -hmm. offered up as their own idea. It was something that we insisted on. And it's were, and, or it's, at least we were getting data. I don't know if it's and we asked it. for the data, which is how we had but, it. But, so I, I just think, um, It is tricky, but but the chief is going to have the data there that's going to inform the how we're going to look to change the culture more than you know that we need this person to be just very skilled, obviously. But if they have this foundation in the data, it seems to me that who they answer to and all that is is slightly less. And so the data becomes really, really important. And for that to have integrity, I think the independence is essential. I think data can have credibility on, on just on its, I mean, depending on how the surveys are designed. I mean, I don't. Exactly, though, but that's the point. Well, some of the data is already there. But the panel so would is, have to approve the final surveys okay. and all the, you know, the let's choices. Hear, let's hear from Karen. Unless we have more questions for Karen. Well, let's let's hear Karen. Karen. Thank you. We'll take you. Yeah. Karen Walker, that's a brilliant idea. So what is the question we're trying to answer right now? All of them. All of them. Yeah. yeah. Well, well, it's a time, it's a chronology. Yeah. Yeah. Who's done first? Yeah. Who, who do we hire? Staff who the versus chicken and consultants. The both. Or one after the other, and where are they housed? Yeah, I think those are the two questions. 
So we've had two. Sure. You know this is, this is, you're our third witness, and the first you two have said no. consult no. first. No. No. Karen. Board and consult Karen. Thank you. I'm Carrie Brown, the executive director of the Vermont Commission on Women. Um, and I just weigh in a little bit on this question about the chicken or the egg. Um, I've been through the process multiple times of bringing in a, a, a consultant from outside an organization to do this full review and to come up with recommendations. Um, they, they will, in my prediction is that, based on my past experience, they'll tell you, you need somebody like this chief officer, you need someone at high, you need to hire a new position at the top level, you need to do trainings, and those are going to be that, and then there'll be other, you know, more specific ones. But they're going to tell you what you've already figured out you need to do, and and so I think that there's a lot of value that a consultant can bring. But I think that the position is the where you really are better off starting. And if you're thinking about investing state money, um, I think that a position is a probably a better long-term investment. Um, if you have the money to bring in a consultant and have them review, <coughs> great, definitely do it. But I think that um, Karen has, has uh, introduced the idea that there may be alternative sources of funding for that kind of assistance. And so I would just concur with the idea that bring in the position first and then figure out how to get that consulting done to elaborate exactly what they need to do. Um, I have a few just sort of little detail things about this, this bill. Um, and some of what you've already addressed. So, the, as far as the name, I don't have a really an idea for the name, but I, but I, but since this is specifically about eradicating systemic racism, mm -hmm. I, I would put something about racism, racism in the title. Correct. Yeah, because equity or civil rights or anything else like that, it sounds like they're doing more. And yeah. if you want to keep that yeah. focus, just keep yeah. that focus. Um, as for as a question about people of color on this panel, I agree that we absolutely have to have a majority of people of color on the panel. And uh, the way what the way our statute for the Commission on Women is written, um, there's one. Of, it, it says that the legislature shall appoint six members, three by the speaker and three by the set, the committee on committees, and that no more than I can't remember the number can be current legislators. And so you have two different appointing authorities, technically the House and the Senate. And together, they can't have more than a certain number of current legislators. So they have to talk to each other. They have to look at who's already been appointed. And so you could just say that you know, no fewer than three will be people of color. And, and they'll figure it out. And they'll figure I'm it out. Sure. They will. Yeah. Yeah. And, but I would put it in there. We also yeah. have in our statute something about, it says members of the commission shall be drawn from X, Y, and Z kinds of diversity. It has no impact at all. It's just sort of a general, this is what you should do. So it has no to be It has to be members. Yeah. Those yeah. are observed in, in our experience. Um, uh, oh, and also in the statute where you talk about the staggered three-year terms, you're going to need to specify that which out. Ones? Which yeah, yeah this, this this one will start here and end here, and, like, and you only have to do it for the beginning. Right. But you have to set up the staggering at the beginning in the statute. Um, okay, let me address that already. Um, Oh, so I have a question, and this is something I just don't know about, but it popped up for me about in, on page four, um, lines six through eight, where it says the proceedings of the panel shall be confidential. And I'm, I'm just wondering about the, is that kosher with um, open, open records meetings, and yeah, open, open meetings? meetings and, well as and you know, the development of the RFP um, seems like it should be a public process. There's no reason for that to be confidential. Um, I'm not sure why any of this needs to be confidential, but maybe there are certain things that do. Maybe if they're doing investigations, that needs to be confidential. But just to sort of say blanketly, all proceedings are confidential, um, except for you know operating procedures and application forms. I think, just this, kind of I think when this me. was written, it was yeah. left over from the last one, which mm -hmm. only had the panel nominating 
right? That, to the governor. Yeah. yeah. So we didn't want and to. I think that's when it was left over. Yeah. I don't think we even need to put that in there. They'll know what to keep confidential and whatnot. Yeah, yeah. and they can always right. do the executive are, session if they need to. Right. 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 We can't actually yeah. prevent them from doing that. Yeah, I think it was left over from then. Good cat. Uh, no, okay. Okay, so then now on page six at the bottom, it says the Department of Human Resources shall work with the Governor's Workforce at the University Council to conduct trainings. That's not something that is um, within the power of, or capability of the Governor's Workforce at the University Council. Um, and just in general, it's mentioned somewhere else too with, about a report, an internal report. Um, and that I, I, I feel a little uh, squeamish about putting, taking a body that exists in executive order and putting it into statute here when it may or may not ever exist again. You know, by executive order, it, it, it could disappear at any time. Um, so I would say that this is really the department of, and you already talked about this whole training question. And so I think that you're, you're addressing that that the Department of Human Resources needs to do training anyway and that they need support and guidance from this new position. But I would I would suggest you just take out that Governor's Workforce at the University Council part. And let's leave that separate. And let's see if I've got a word back. Let's see. And then um Sounds like maybe you've already made a decision about the um, consultant part of it, and I do. I agree with both Karen and Carrie that it probably, I don't think it makes sense to do that first. And I think sometimes the reason that um, people think of that is because you might not be sure to what extent the problem exists. And I think that there are there's a lot of studying that's already been done, and there's a lot of data. So I think that even if a consultant was hired after you put the chief in place, that, that if they're smart, they're going to go after all the information that's already there. Because I've been doing this work since I was like, you know, 18 years old, and, I, and that's what I've heard every year. Let's do a study. Let's do a study. Let's do a study. Frankly, it's kind of tiring. Um, and the thing about trying to get around, keep, you know, the contention around this issue, you can't. I mean, if you're going to an organization and saying that we've determined that there are yeah, racial disparities and systemic racism across all systems, it's not a question of whether or not they exist or even to what extent. It's how are we going to fix them. So I was encouraged to hear you say something about data. Um, and, you know, I, I'm, I serve on the, I hate this title. <laughs> you want to say it for me, Karen? Sure. The, the Attorney General's uh, advisory panel on blah, 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 racial, you know, juvenile and, and criminal justice. And so a lot, and I actually have been involved a little bit in the um, education bill that people are working on to try to get uh, ethnic studies in as, as like basic curriculum. And it's really interesting to be part of those conversations and hear the same thing in every place. Mm -hmm. Like, we need to study this some more. Mm -hmm. How bad is the problem, really? I mean, it's really bad. Karen and David's report has information about it. You know what I mean? So just from somebody who's kind of been pretty deep in it a long time and experienced it myself, I think you guys are moving in the right direction. And I just really wanted to say that. I, I do agree with what both of, of, of Karen and Carrie are saying about the um, 
order in which you put those things in place. The other thing that um, I was asked to do, Mark Hughes is sick today, so he just asked me to read his testimony. It's not uh, terribly long, so. While you're looking, studies are what we do when we aren't sure what to do. We have studies. Yeah, right. right. Um, but, yeah, but I mean, there are, um, there's a lot of information that's already out there. Or when we, when we know we need to do something, but we need facts and figures to back up right. some of right. yeah. them. And of it. also, I mean, it's to even just know which, direc which direction you're going mm -hmm. in. Yeah. Um, Oh, wait, 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 sorry. Okay, here we go. Okay, I'm not Mark Hughes. It says, I'm Mark Hughes, Executive Director of Justice for All. I won't be appearing today due to illness. We have put forward language for composition and process surrounding this commission. Further, we have outlined a legislative approach to address racial profiling and use, and use of force. Two areas that most certainly require attention at this time. Finally, we have provided an approach to expand the HRC as civil liberties are under attack at a national level. We have received no indication that any of this is important to the Senate Committee on Government Operations. Meanwhile, we have watched as you enable law enforcement to become increasingly self-governing, S-192, provide additional power and authority to the Public Safety Commissioner, S-198, and place additional law enforcement seats on the Criminal Justice Training Council while removing civilians, S-273. We are, in fact, still waiting to see the response from this body, oversight of law enforcement in the state, to the Vermont Criminal Justice Training Council's unilateral change to the fair and partial policing policy that happened on November 21st, 2017, in response to threat of federal grant losses. Vermont spends over $574 million annually on so-called public safety and brags to be the safest state in the United States. Just who is safe in Vermont, where we have 4,000 law enforcement officers, excluding federal, and 6,300 African Americans, where one in 14 of the males are incarcerated. You, you know, I gotta stop right there. Like, you really have to ask yourself why our jails in Vermont look the way that they do. Mm -hmm. There, it's either because black and brown people are inherently more criminal or they're being profiled. One of those two things is true. They can't both be true. And, and if you look at the data that the Department of Corrections is happy to provide for you, that has been the case for as long as I've been involved in this. And I've been involved in this. I was one of the first people that um, asked for data collection in Chittenden County through an organization called Uncommon Alliance. And the, our jails have looked the way that they, they do now since then. You can't see the relationship here. More concerning is the fact that you just don't get it. And as the incarceration rate of African Americans has gone up now to 11%, what is most insulting is your audacity to once again bring someone like Mr. Reed in, who has been on the state payrolls for the past 15 years with no apparent success and hold them out as somebody who is actually seeking to fix the problem. I think that um, when Can I get finish? To talk about personality. Can I just finish? It's about like results-based accountability. But it shouldn't be about But it history. shouldn't be about Okay, all right. I'm reading someone else's testimony. I know. Seeking to fix the problem that some people continue to profit from. This is less a reflection on him and more a reflection on you and a perfect example of how some things don't change. It's my hope that in your deliberations that at some point you will come to the conclusion that you're part of the problem. And in either way, perhaps this is precisely what we need as a state to be in our much needed wake up call. As I have since day one, I ask you that you adopt the language the coalition proposed, sponsor, support an amendment, and pass S-281 out of committee as a funded independent commission. Thank you for taking up S-281, providing us the opportunity to testify.
I mean, different people have different truths, right? I mean, it's still America, right? Yes, but we don't. We try to treat everybody with respect in here and not put anybody down for to talk about people's um, culpabilities or but you have culpabilities. To the results, and if you yes. keep doing the same thing and getting the yes. same results, you shouldn't do the yes. same thing over and over again. And we're trying not to. Okay. We are working really hard, and and I do want people to know that. Uh, first of all, I'm getting tons and tons and tons of. Um, emails and notes from uh, primarily Burlington and Washington County that insist on this being passed as was put forth by the um, the panel, the Racial Justice Reform Coalition. Um, that isn't going to happen as it's put forward by it isn't going to happen. We've already moved past that. So we're trying to incorporate and do the best we can. And I don't think anybody here has any thoughts that we're just playing games or not doing anything. We're trying really hard to do the best we can here and to get something in place that really will work and will make a difference. When you determine the experts it's a, are, yes. base it on results. Yes. We, we, yes, Diana? Yeah. Thank you. Could I just offer, because totally separate from 281, the assertion is we've removed civilians from law enforcement, which is the LEAB, which is not accurate. That's not true. It's just not true. And that we have concentrated authority over law enforcement by into more hands of law enforcement, which is, in fact, the opposite of yeah. what's true. We've, we took it out. We've just passed the bill to put it into OPR, which is our civilian oversight. So I... I I don't know where these ideas come from sometimes, but then they get repeated so much and we don't correct them. Those are two direct assertions which are, in fact, the opposite of the work we're doing. And, and you know, it's not to sedate, say that there's not things of value that Mr. Hughes brings forward and that, that I totally agree with, but I just need to correct those two details because they're fairly easy to correct, they're very easy to measure, and they are just not accurate in the way he's portraying them. Yes, thank you. Thank you. I'm Diana Bali. I'm with the Community Equity Collaborative coming from Wyndham County. And I have some written testimony here that, like Karen's, was written before this most recent draft was done. So I'll, um, I'll try to skip through things that have already been added and be as quick as possible, because I know time's a factor here. This uh, testimony is, uh, stems from a, a meeting that I had with a representative group of our council, that um, our collaborative, that uh, I, I reviewed the notes from our last meeting, the last committee meeting with. And so these, uh, <coughs> these comments, some of them are technical questions, but um, others are, are more for discussion before a final decision or vote is taken. The first one is more just uh, a question, technical question, that um, the words institutional racism or mitigation are used, but is there a definition that should be included in the legislation that might help people who are newer to this topic or who are entertaining voting for it um, be clear about what what the meaning of it is, that an agreed on meaning. And I put forth, this was very um, kind of Googling on the, you know, the, uh, the People's Institute definition, but there might be a shorter and more concise one that you've already been working with, but the question was just maybe put it in as a clarification for people who are seeing the bill for the first time. Um, the second comment in this area about defining was just the realization, uh, and we've heard this certainly from the experience of the other people giving testimony, that this kind of enormous uh, task takes time and that we're probably talking about a 10-year period here of, of really seeing change and feeling proud of um, the directions that we're going in. Regarding the um, advisory panel, the, the tasks, uh, and I'm, I'm thinking again of what we've heard about, whether it's the HR commission or the, um, 
the council that deals with governor's equity and diverse workforce, that these voluntary tasks um, are extremely time consuming, especially for this large uh, assignment. And as much pay as you are able to give, I think would um, be a good investment as part of the budget. Uh, it still will be voluntary in some stage, but as much pay as you can give, whether it's using the Green Mountain Care Board as a model, um, where you did see dedicated work that was done um, in an ongoing way. Uh, learning from that model, I think, would be, would be very useful. And we listed the responsibilities we um, considered from last week's uh, discussion, but the addition of preparing reports and, and endorsing them is, um, only makes that recommendation stronger. Along with everybody else that's testified, a majority of panel members being people of color. Um, so now moving on to the chief officer position and the, the name, which you'll, you'll find the best name, but the, the um, present one not being perhaps somehow incorporating systemic racism is, is a really good idea. So on my page two of my testimony, this is much more of a, a global kind of concern that's uh, in a way has been brought up through the other discussions that you've had today. Um, it, it's stemming from an experience that we've had um, in our part of the state regarding SIT's chief diversity officer. So um, after much um, concern expressed by students at SIT, this is the School for International Training, um, about uh, just racial disparities on the, on the campus within the way the programs were, done, uh, were prepared with the faculty, etc., a chief diversity officer was hired. And um, I wrote here what I think are the key concerns about what has happened because after only four months, she resigned. And I think we can learn from, um, although of course this is a much smaller scale, this example, than what we're talking about. I think we can learn from it. So, um, and I think we can also research other situations nationally where um, we found a, a a great vision for hiring a, a person to do this work, and they have not succeeded. Mm. So um, the main concern is a highly qualified person of color is appointed and expected to solve the institution's issues. What evolves is they do not have enough backup or authority and end up resigning in frustration. So what happened at SIT um, was a lesson in that way, in that um, an excellent candidate was hired. And uh, she put forth a very well thought out, comprehensive strategy. But she was not placed in a, in a place of authority um, within, uh, within the administrative team. And, and she therefore resigned. So any thinking that is given to um, the way to create this balance that you're talking about of independence but also respect and uh, partnership, which led our team that looked this over to um, a recommendation that we have one staff person that is being recommended in this piece of legislation, but really we feel that a multiracial team doing the work would be much more effective. And that might be that there is one point officer who is working on a cabinet level, but that they be, from the get-go, part of a multiracial team that has a whole range of skills and abilities, we think is something to really consider and to build into the plan. Um, so uh, what, what we said here was a carefully crafted job description needs to be developed in advance, ensuring a range of skills um, that maybe one person couldn't have. Um, skills and ability reflected on the team. And um, naming in advance the types of uh, supportive framework and the environment that will support these new positions. So um, from then on in that section, um, 
the recommendation is, is, is uh, very complementary to the other testimonies of saying that the officer or this team, if you consider that to be a good next step, should be appointed right from the start and should be um, part of this whole needs assessment review inventory that is done. Um, they themselves, if they are from out of state, would learn through the process and certainly the inventory itself is the first step in an educational process for everybody that is doing this work. So um, I think I've covered that and in this uh, needs assessment section that we see the inventory as a power analysis. Uh, the depth of the inquiry relates to the quality of the outcome and of course would be across the gamut of including recruitment, hiring, retention, workplace culture, client advocacy, and of course data collection. I think this has been said, but I'll just repeat that we are putting um, the participants in the inventory and in the review in a very um, delicate situation because we're basically saying um, you are part, as we all are, of, of a, a system that is has racial disparities. And so we're, my, our words here were, it's an inventory that's excavating people's worst fears. And, um, and so the, the, the skill of the, the team, the consultants that prepare this review um, is, it can't be estimated enough. And so the Ford Foundation idea um, since that is something the that they, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so, Carrie has already stated that um, the council, the Governor's Equity and Diverse Workforce Council, um, really should. Um, I, I suggested that it be, it be part of the assessment, that and it, instead of it only being of the three branches of government, that the council also. Um, be included in that assessment so that if they might have recommendations for how their work could somehow realign, but they could honestly say what their capacity is through that assessment. Do, sir, da, Diana, do you serve on the council? I don't. I don't. But I'm just. You're co chair, right? She is the co chair, with along with Lori Laura. Alburn. Yeah. yeah. Um, and so, in, in closing, just to say that. Um, I've already stated what I think a comprehensive curriculum needs to be once the training is designed, but that that is the, uh, the officers or the team of officers task, that they design the training and are part of the um, overall implementation of it. Thank you. Those were my Thank you. Thoughts. Good afternoon. Um, I'm Stephen Emmerich. Uh, that's my greatest claim to fame. The reason for being here is I was born in this lovely town. I uh, spent a long time away, uh, much of it in Texas. So I, uh, regretfully, although you can run into this anywhere, I have great experience with seeing people abused. Um, I've heard a lot of you make mention of how enormous this task is. And while I agree with you wholeheartedly, I think as some of these other people have testified, the identity of the problem is pretty clear. You just hire someone who has experience with this and they can tell you what they're gonna find. But if you want them to prove it, then you'll have to show instances that it, exa it exists here. But that's the only job we've got. We know it exists. And the fact that, um, uh, not to cast blame because I, appreciate very much what you people are doing, but you are part of the system as well, and you have to wear the badge. We have to what? Wear the badge. I think we do. Carry. I think you do very well yes. as well. I'm just encouraging you to do so and to not be afraid of the task if something you're up to. We're not Thank afraid so we're here. I see that. I'm very proud to have you. Thank you. Thank you. Good day. All right, pretty. So now I'm more convinced than I was when we came in here. But I think we, 
have to make some we have to make some decisions. And if we don't make these decisions today and tomorrow, it's not going to happen. That's we have we have to have this out. It has to go to appropriations, and um, so we need to get it out. So we, we need, need to get it out tomorrow. Or we, I would prefer us getting it out tomorrow. We can wait till Thursday, but I, we can't wait till after Thursday. It has to be done by Thursday. So yes. to help give us some data to make decisions on how much money and stuff we want to include, I have emailed Steve Klein and I've pushed back on him and just given us S. He said, oh, I need a week to give you that data. I'm like, oh, really? Let's find out when you but I've also emailed a very close friend who's a McKinsey consultant uh, and does huge consultancy projects and asked him, A, if he knows any with, with this kind of expertise um, and has done a systems-wide analysis of something particular uh, and what a systems-wide kind of consultancy would cost. Okay. And, and so just to get it, so I've, Good. I've done that. Thank you. What I would like to do is go through and list the things that I think we need to make decisions about. When we get to the part about the money, we can fill in the, we can put yeah. a dollar in there and then fill it in. Yeah, I just want We to need to figure out, and some of these are pretty logistical and little issues, we need to figure out the name of this panel, and we need to figure out the name of this person. Mm -hmm. We have to, we have to do that. Yeah. So what I've heard so far is that we should appoint the, panel by September. Are we still all there? Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That we should in there say that um, at least three persons should be persons of, now some people said persons of color and some people said persons should reflect an ethnic and racial diversity. I think you just got to say people of color. Okay, I, I don't care. I mean, care. if you reflect the ethnic diversity in Vermont, you could have five white people. Okay. Well, I was just. I was. No, 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 I, I hear you, but I think, said I I think that. we heard said that it needs to be very clear. Shall be a majority. Well, and people of color is a, a big range. I, I, yeah, I'm just saying that we need to make these decisions so yep. that we can get yep. the language, and that it should have ge geographic diversity. Yes. Do I? Yes. Okay. Yes to all those. So we need to have that done by September. Yes. Then. The decision is: Do we hire a? Do we put in hiring a chief, uh, or whatever that person is, by January, or do we hire a consultant first? And it leads in both directions. Some people say we need to have a consultant first. Some people say we need to have the the consultant first to help identify what the person, what we're actually looking for, and defining the um, what needs to be done. I, I, okay. So I would just say that we had four people, and one was the administration, who's slightly compromised because they don't want us to spend any more money, and their mantra is no money. And then we had three other people who've done this work suggesting we uh, that the panel hire a, a, a chief, a, a mitigator of systemic racism, and first. So I would tend to go with the people of experience who aren't tied to the administration and have no financial agenda. And so I would suggest that the next thing that the panel would do would be to appoint a, a mitigator of systemic racism. Okay, I, I, I think I did hear um, from Mr. Reed that one of the things that, that the consulting team would do would be to, uh, that there needed to be a point person, but that the consulting team would actually help define what needs to be done and what that person needs to do and how to do an inventory um, that would lead to. So I think I heard him say we needed a point person, but we should do the consulting well first. And if that's wrong, I so think anyway, he said we that have second. These... You're absolutely right. But first, he said you yeah. hire the panel, you hire the chief, you do the RFP, you get the he consulting firm, you do the recommendations. Okay, we and just need I to make the decision. Back off and change it. Yeah. Right. We just so. need to make the decision. Chief first for six months. Yes. I okay. would be chief first. Mm -hmm. yes. So there's a six month um, in the budget. Six months worth of budget in there and. 
The panel will do that. Where will this person sit? That's Who? a great question. That is that's a question. huge. That's the independent because question. it's not because you know the new ethics chair and having to run around and get used computers and desks. Was a little sad to me. I'd like to avoid that. Yeah, state government. <laughs> yeah, but the end of, uh, but I thought Karen's point was also accurate. Yeah. Don't forget, we have to stagger. We have to actually. Oh yeah, I got that, that in your stagger, stagger color. Oh, really? That's just this important. Like yeah. Yeah, but That's we have to deal. say, you know. Yeah. The governor gets a one. Yeah, no, no, we're okay with that. We'll, okay. yeah. We can deal with that. That's not a... But, so where they live... Yes, I think that that is the most essential decision we have left to make. What agency has the most power? Well, the question isn't what agency has the most power. The question is, should they even live in an agency, or should they be totally independent? I tend to think that they have to have some some relationship within the administration somehow or they're not going to have the but I, I could be convinced that I'm wrong administrative support etc well and and the cloud yeah. to say I mean we can say in here that um, and I don't know how the women's commission works if you have cloud and you can say agency of natural resources you better do this you, that's the, that power is not it's not in our list of right. duties, but I think that the Human Rights Commission would be a more equivalent. But those are cases, right? Though that right. isn't. It would maybe, be as a result of a case, right? A complaint-driven case, right? But this isn't right. But we so when we do a complaint, um, we look at not for the relief if we're going to make a settlement, for example, the relief for the aggrieved party is one piece of it, which is often money. The other piece is we look at systemic issues within that agency that or, or body that need to be resolved and we make them agree to adopt policies and to provide training and to do these other things that are more systemic in nature and we have the ability to enforce that in court if they don't do it. So, so do you have, as a result of that, have you seen change in departments or in areas that you have asked for that and you have collected data on that and that all? Is this in state government? It's in state governments and private it's um, everywhere. Private yeah. as well, but it's within um, sheriffs and police departments. It's within the Department of Motor Vehicles. It's um, in what state? We have seen sure. we have seen change as a result of that. Yeah, we did access. Access. I mean, I did a lot of access with your commission. Access. Okay. Well, so maybe if I could ask Karen a question, just. When you were, were were you around when the Human Rights Commission was established? I, I don't remember. No, it was in 1988. This is the 30th anniversary of the National Human Rights Commission. Was Bob the first? No, it was Susan Sussman. That's right. Susan Sussman. Harvey Gullibach, and then Robert Pell, and then, and then so yeah. there's only been four executive directors. Right. Chris, no, Chris had. Oh. Well, I just uh, that would be helpful to understand that. Like the physical questions of where 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 were you always housed where you are now I don't even know where that is but in the space yeah no they've moved around I think this is at least the third or fourth place that you've been but it's a new I I just I would agree with your chair I think that that we have to figure out a way for this person to be at the table because I think this this person has to be at that the cabinet table and for lack of a better term saying, okay, Tommy Anderson, what are you doing about this? You know, and, 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 and keeping people's, it being a very strong presence and, and, and keeping them all aware. I mean, Karen isn't at the table. She's, and she'll, I mean, that's got problems. This person has to be at the table and considered a force of nature, well, you know, a force. Well, well, I, to me, that's I, not what we're talking about. Yeah, but that is because that's they have it. to be in my. I I support this notion that they be housed in the executive branch. Um, however, we said it here: the ex housed in the executive branch and yet okay. operating independently of the governor's office and the governor's cabinet. Well, the the thing I see as different is that any any um, commands or. Uh, suggested changes or uh, 
that come out of a Human Rights Commission come out as a result of a case. That's where they come from. We, I, I think we need to, we don't need to have cases here that go to court that what we want is we want something proactive. If there is an issue that needs to be somehow dragged through court and, and um, court uh, orders be issued, that's one thing. But I see this role as very different than taking cases, being in um, a kind of a quasi or a judicial function, and actually giving orders. I, I see this person, this, what we're hoping for here is to have really buy-in and positive right. movement and mm -hmm. and so I see it as very, very different. I and, agree. And affecting change. I mean really being a change maker. Yeah. And 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 that may take, as Diana says, it, it's gonna take us a while. But So where do they live? Executive branch. I think executive branch. I think they have to. Because I admire and applaud Karen, but I know Karen is such, I mean, Karen is there. Well, I'm in the executive branch. Oh, you are? <laughs> yes. Everybody is like somewhere. Even oh, the ethics okay. commission. Sorry. Yes. But, but that doesn't keep, get you into cabinet meetings. No, I'm not cabinet meetings. But I'm saying it doesn't get you. I mean, you can't mandate what meetings you get invited to. But well, we could, we could create a cabinet position. Yeah. I believe we could do that. I don't see. Sure, we could. Channel your inner OB. You could do it. Does it make sense? Does it make sense? Yeah, but you can't wait, have wait. it be independent. You can't say, Governor, you will have this person in your staff. That's crazy. You can't do that. There's got to be. I, I, I'd be amazed if that doesn't run foul. Claire, it, you had a good conversation with, um, I can't think of Bill Scott's lawyer. Suzanne. Suzanne. Well, does it make sense to speak with her and tell her what we're looking for to see how that can happen? Well, we did. I did. Oh, you did talk and about secretaries she, and at the table. Well, what she suggested is having this consultant first uh -huh. to to do that to kind of lay the groundwork and oh, all right. do all right. that. So mm -hmm. if we've moved off that idea. Then, then. Mm. Um, that, yeah. I mean, we you can have the conversation with her again about where the person actually lives in. Can we can we create a cabinet position? I I just made that up that we could. But <laughs> but we can find out what we can do. If we create if we made a, a agency of systemic um, Yes, we did this one mitigation of systemic racism and made it an agency then it would be a secretary and it would be uh, at the cabinet yeah, level. And we did this with the agency of education we created a cabinet. Position. But there was already something there. Yeah, but, <laughs> and we gave the governor you, are you really not saying that we gave yeah, the governor no, no, I, you get to name a secretary. Yeah, yeah. That's a pretty big difference uh, than yeah. what we're talking about. No, I agree. That okay. part wasn't I'm going to put a big um, circle around that one. I think we need to sleep on that one. Well, we need to sleep on a lot of these. And um, let's see, what else? Uh, mitigator of systemic racism. I'm kind of oh, getting no, a little bit of that. Sorry. Chief Chuckle. mitigator. Right, chief right. mitigator. <laughs> right, chief. Right, chief. Mitigator. What else uh, do we have to, we don't want to have um, the penalties, right? Because the penalties yeah. already exist under yeah. the APA. Back the penalties. Yeah. But to uh, compel data. Yes, I think, and I think the language in here is managing and overseeing the statewide collection of race-based data and ensuring such data are publicly available. I think that's that pretty good a language. There's bunch of pieces in here that are. And um, I don't like creating model policies, but I never liked model policies okay. myself. But they would call the NAACP and ask them to send Andrew Young up here in the Don't you think they would? Do, do what? Call the NAACP and ask them for help with us. They'll send somebody. Andrew Young? Yeah. You mean yeah. to create this bill? Mm, well, to at least advise, if not actually assume the consultancy. I bet they would. Well, if we can do the consultant, but we've got to pass a bill by Friday. By Thursday. Yes, yeah, sorry. We we're, we're only the first cog in the process. Yes, and this is, bill is also going to go to the House. 
Yeah. Well, it has a no uh, doubt unhooked so everything we've <laughs> so carefully tried to do anyway. So we're trying to create a framework that will carry this. So I. Okay. So we got bag for penalties. What, what is it? You said you're part of the executive. Are you within an agency? Yes. Yeah, so the, the Human Rights Commission is an agency within the executive. It is. It's, you're your own agency. We are our own agency. That's how we are. And that's you as well. As is the, well, the Human Rights Commission. I mean, the Ethics Commission isn't its own agency, and but it's its own thing <coughs> within the executive branch. And you scrapped around for chairs and computers. We scrap around for everything, just like everybody else in the state. I mean, it's like <laughs> it's what you can afford in your budget, right? And, and there's no budget, so. So maybe that, that doesn't satisfy my office supply concern, but it answers. Um, you know, we just direct BGS to give them space, and but then it comes out of their budget. It will come out of their budget, yeah. but the space, right? It'll come out oh, of this panel space. Oh yes, it'll yeah. come out of the budget as will all the. So if you just put it under the AOA, then it will come out of it. Of course, if we can get rid of all those twelve hundred guns that they have stored, there will be a lot of space. Well, we're not going to get. Oh, we're that's store we're melt them down <laughs> for precious scrap metal. Um, oh man. Yes. So they're housed in the executive branch, but I would argue. That they are, uh, that they don't have the muscle, you know, on a day to day basis, as much as I love and respect what they do, that they are still on the side by not being, and I don't know what I really mean by being at the table, but I mean being involved and included and mm, a little more fully than they are. I mean, you know, they may feel differently, but as an outsider looking at, at fighting for attention, those values uh, are great, but they're on the side. They may be in the executive branch, but they're not. You know, I don't, I haven't seen the administration uh, taking on those values and those priorities in both those commissions and making them happen in state government. But so, it's, But it's not the charge. Well, but in some ways it is. I mean, why haven't administrations taken on the issues of, of equity and pay for women? Why haven't they taken on making a, a priority accessibility for all Vermonters? Why haven't, you know, they just haven't done those things. And yet these fabulous commissions exist, but I would argue they aren't making it happen. And on their own, you know, and I think that this person's really gonna make it happen they have to be more woven into the fabric of how of, of how decisions are made and, and where money is pri prioritized and you know all the big decisions money uh, resources and change. So at one point we did talk about that the rub here is that if we put tell somebody if we tell the governor it's going to be a, a cabinet level position. It's really hard then to tell the governor who it's going to be. When we started, we talked about the panel forwarding a couple names and the governor appointing somebody. Mm -hmm. And we decided against that because right. they were still beholden to the governor. So I don't know that we can have them not beholden to the governor and have the authority. I, I, I mean, we have to. I, th I, I think we house them at the agency administration, but we keep them independent, and we're not getting everything. But we're, I would rather have them next door to the, or in the same office as the people they're regulating mm -hmm. with independence than, you know, we heard from that woman at yes. transportation mm -hmm. that it's an issue yeah. to, to yeah. try to change behavior of your boss is hard. This is like, well, you try to change behavior of your colleagues that you don't actually answer to. I, yeah. I think that's better. Yeah. So in the agency of administration, but, and with the, uh, the way she, Bryn has this written is that the person has the duties and responsibilities of a secretary, 
but that they wouldn't necessarily be, it would kind of be up to the governor whether they yes, sat yeah. on the cabinet yes. or not. They're at a cabinet level and they have those responsibilities and those duties, but we can't tell the governor he has to let them sit on the right. cabinet. So their their cabinet has to work collaboratively with that. Yeah. I think that's right. But and they sit within the executive branch. Um, so those two look okay then, those two sentences, mm. those two. I think so. Okay. Well, did you want to add, um, are you talking about the two sentences in B? I'm talking about both A and B. Mm -hmm. um, I think we can take out, but shall operate independently, that they have the right, but since they're already appointed by the panel, yeah. I would say it again, them. because if you want to make sure it's independent, I would say it. I'd say it again. But here, this is within the executive branch, but you're not saying here agency of administration. No, it says it later on somewhere. It did say Technical it. Technical support of the, it's line 15. Ah, okay. So you don't feel you need to say Administrative, that legal, and technical support of the agency of administration, i.e. So give them a desk. Which it's within the executive branch, but it isn't, in, it isn't under the Secretary of the Agency of Administration. They're providing support. I mean, support. a lot of it in the end is going to go through HR in terms yeah. of trainings. That's under AOA. You know, it, it yeah. just is, it, it potentially gives the discussion about buy-in. I mean. Uh, well, here. Oh, no. So I would, given this conversation, uh, you, we might entertain saying on line eight, uh, something all housed in the agency of administration uh, shall operate independently, well, period. I, and not say of the governor's cabinet, but just say it shall operate independently. I don't, I think that if we have the concept here, Bryn was here when we talked about this, I think she'll be able to figure yeah. out the words. Okay. I don't think we should, Wordsmith, because we're not the lawyers. When did that stop? <laughs> <laughs> well, she did. She was here for that discussion, and she I was. think she yeah. said she could come up with some language so that they had the authority of the of a secretary. I mean, of a cabinet level position. That's what mm -hmm. that is on line eight. But that they and they were there, but they were somewhat independent. No, I mean, I, I, okay. All right. And we, we do we agree that the panel should also have the same kind of name? Whatever. Yeah, I think that systemic racism. Mitigation whatever panel. the panel is. Yeah. Yeah. So it's a. I, I think that we need to have something. I'm going to put the mitigation we make up. What mitigation we make up for, or it's not the same as eradication. Eradication is a total white. Mitigation yeah. means fixing. That's, that's you sure? Identifying and fixing. Mitigate, make it that you know. Here, let's get the definition. I'll get a good definition. I think you weigh out an equal benefit or something. It has a, I think it has. Are a you well, when you definition. mitigate the, the the results of planting, of um, putting, um, yeah. uh, fixing. Or, yeah, yeah, taking up a wetland, you just buy a up, chunk yeah. somewhere else. Right. right. I just think that that, that term is so little. Is, we use it like a lot there. Buy, okay, buy. mitigate. An action of reducing the severity, seriousness, or painfulness of something. Mm -hmm. um, are you skipping pieces of it and picking out the ones you like? No. That, that's the whole lot of scrolling there. And it tells me how to pronounce it, too. Oh. Um, I'm scrolling down to see the next thing. It says, um, the act of mitigating or lessening the force or intensity of something unpleasant as wrath, pain, grief, or extreme circumstances. Social support is the most important factor in okay. the mitigation. Okay, okay, okay that's I'm enough. Good. I, that's enough. I need some we, we need Get to... I was thinking about wetlands okay. and that sort of stuff, which is sort of like being bought off. What we need to do is um, get to, I'll Basic. go to Bryn and talk to her about making some of these changes. We will um, come back here tomorrow. No. Yes, we will. And let's Betsy has been sitting here waiting can. all this time for another bill that we have all left. Well, that's yeah. okay if they've left. Mm -hmm. They. So. 
So I will get to Bryn and make some suggestions, have her undo everything she just what did. What it says at the bottom. And, um,